So welcome to uh, all uh, participants and speakers to this webinar. So this webinar called the Circular Metal for Future Mobility, Aluminium for Lightweight and Sustainability. I think uh, we will highlight this uh, during this um, webinar. So my name is Christian Leroy. I am in charge of innovation uh, within uh, Urban Aluminium, and it's my pleasure, let's say, to, to welcome you and to open this um, this webinar. Uh, so I will be the host with my colleague Francesca Cafezza. She's highly uh, involved into this Salema project because this webinar is organized under the umbrella of this Salema project, and we will highlight uh, the main results of this um, uh, project, uh, ongoing project uh, today, uh, especially to Eureka through Mano. Um, so maybe a few uh, elements from um, for today. So um, regarding the organization, so um, so there will be two sessions and they will be recorded. Uh, so up to no no objection from speakers. So there will be an opportunity to look at this uh, afterwards. Uh, the video will be shared with the participants uh, and this link will be made public on the, the website of Salema so uh, so that uh, it will be accessible to uh, all stakeholders. Um, to raise your questions, we invite you to use the Q&A tool. So um, we, the chat is not accessible or not functioning, but the uh, Q&A will be accessible and we invite you to, let's say, raise your question there as a participant and the chair will uh, raise, organize the, the session in a way that uh, potentially will, uh, let's say, refer to your question uh, to, the, uh, um, to the, the, the speaker. And please mention your name and uh, organization so that uh, it helps for the chair to, to share your, your question. Uh, you will not be able to unmute and, and to activate your camera, so uh, sorry for that, but it's to facilitate the organization, otherwise it becomes too uh, difficult to, to manage. Um, okay, now uh, regarding the, the, the two sessions, so the, the first session would provide an overview about um, the scene, let's say, uh, looking at the importance of aluminium in cars, also looking at the specific critical raw material uh, magnesium. As you know, it was quite uh, critical uh, in the last year, so uh, there will be a focus on that as well, and then uh, we will focus on the Salema project as such. This would be the, the first session, and then the second session will be the opportunity, the occasion to look at other uh, projects, uh, EU projects uh, very connected to uh, aluminium and, and um, the, 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 the automotive value chain. So we will have Fatigue for Light, uh, we will have Flamingo and Flex Crush. So these three EU projects, uh, um, which are also connected to, to, to the aluminium value chain. So I think we will have a good overview and, and Cross-fertilization, this is uh, one objective of this workshop, is to look at cross-fertilization as well and see if we can have synergies with other EU projects. Um, okay, so um, I will give a few introductions, also with the help of uh, my colleague uh, Francesca Cafezza, uh, highlighting a little bit uh, European aluminium and uh, aluminium use, and then a, a quick focus on the innovation hub and, and introduction to the Salema project. Um, yeah, a few words about European aluminium. In fact, we represent the European aluminium industry in Europe, so uh, especially the, the primary production, but also the recycling and the transformation, especially extrusion and rolling. Uh, we have more or less 100 uh, members, uh, more than 600 plants in Europe, representing 1 million jobs, direct and indirect jobs. Uh, obviously, in terms of application, you can see there that uh, the transport is a big uh, dominant, let's say, uh, application with 40% and automotive is a big part, so we will focus on that today. Uh, but building packaging are quite important as well, with 24% for building and 19 for packaging. And then you have some other uh, applications. So, uh, But it's clear that automotive is an important market and, and we will focus today on that. Um, some of the figures, okay, we represent more or less 40 billion uh, euro in terms of turnover. Uh, it's clear that recycling is an important uh, aspect for aluminium, especially in Europe. Construction and automotive are a very high re recycling rate at end of life, at end of life as you, you may know. 
And in terms of primary production, okay, we represent 6%. It's clear that China is dominating, but we are still there and, and uh, obviously trying to, to keep our place. But in terms of transformation, we are much more important. Um, so, uh, and, and we have more or less 50% coming from uh, recycling sources as a supply. So it shows the importance of recycling in, in Europe. Um, yeah, this is briefly an overview. Here you have all members. Uh, okay, you are maybe familiar with some of these logos, but, but uh, you see that we cover quite well the value chain from alumina up to recycling. Um, and uh, yeah, we are proud to, to be well covered in Europe by, by uh, many, having many members. Um, yeah, so now starting to touch the, the topic of today, it's clear really that um, if you look at the scenarios uh, for aluminium market in the coming years, it's a growing market especially uh, regarding the contribution of aluminium for clean energy. It is perceived as a, uh, a neighbor for that, uh, for the electric vehicles, for example, for the solar panel and all energy transition and electricity network expansion. So these are clearly areas of developments and, and we are still obviously highly uh, present in traditional, let's say, applications uh, like packaging, building, and still uh, transport, uh, aeronautics, and so on. So I see that uh, we are seen as a key enabler for those uh, transitions. So and, and, and the vision, the forecasts are, let's say, uh, gross, and this is highlighted here. So all in all, this is expected that uh, almost 20 million tons of um, aluminium demand will have will be there in, in Europe, uh, meaning uh, an increase of 30 to 40 percent compared of today. So more or less uh, more than one percent uh, growth per year. So it's clear that this would be covered by primary, but also surely by a big part uh, from recycling. So we need to intensify recycling and, and Salema project is uh, about that as well. So I think it's clearly well, uh, let's say, positioned into the strategic evolution of, of aluminium uh, uh, in Europe. So um, then I will give the floor to my colleague Francesca. She will continue with, uh, let's say, topics which are more connected to the Salema and wish to hold a, a good uh, workshop, a good webinar today. So please, Francesca. Thank you, Thank you Christian. As uh, Christian mentioned, Salema project, it's about so we want to very briefly uh, highlight some of the challenges which are uh, on recycling end of life vehicles um, regarding um, one of the main problem and which is already uh, like faced by Salem as well and they're trying to move forward with Salem as well is that end of life vehicles are shared together with other products which makes um, a scrap which is extremely complex because it's full of contaminants, because there are uh, several uh, alloy elements and so on. So what happens is that mostly this end of life scrap uh, ends up being part of uh, uh, secondary foundry alloys, which nowadays are mostly used uh, for uh, combustion energy. Um, Salem is not only a project about vehicles, it's a project about electric vehicles, because that's the future, because uh, eventually the IC um, will be even banned uh, by the market. So by uh, this evolution means that what Casting, so uh, everything that now now goes into the combustion engine, that will be not an outlet anymore. Um, so there must be a way um, to uh, be sure that uh, we can actually reuse uh, um, aluminium in the, in the best way possible. How to do so? Um, one way is to improve sorting technologies, and this uh, will be touched um, by uh, Manel uh, in the presentation on how Salema is looking at that. Um, it's important as well to um, increase the dismantling of uh, um, aluminium components which have a higher value and um, what is important as well is to looking not only at the recycling while the, uh, the car reach the end of life but to think about that while the car is designed in the first place so to really um, focus on design for recycling and uh, um, to think about how the car will be dismantled and recycled while designing the car uh, itself. So within European aluminium, we have done several studies to look a bit at this um, very complex puzzle, which is made of different parts, and to see 
uh, how we can, uh, um, let's say, um, cover this gap. So there were several studies which cover uh, several parts of the aluminum um, of the end of life vehicle um, value chain. And then you can see that are um, yeah, they're all internal studies. So for example, there was a study on uh, second, uh, like market development beyond uh, secondary casting uh, alloys, uh, the feasibility of dismantling end of life vehicles for aluminum components. We looked as well of uh, what are the technologies for sourcing postal uh, consumer aluminum scrap within um, yeah, uh, of end of life vehicles as well. And um, we looked at other ways, for example, not necessarily, we are looking at other ways, not necessarily on sorting, but uh, really to purify uh, the aluminum metal and not uh, like uh, the, um, not to sort the, the scrap. And all this way, they're not like one or the other, they're all complementary, let's say. So there will be not a solution for everything. They're all, uh, um, yeah, they, they will look complementary to the final scope to have the best recycling possible of aluminum. And we do that uh, within European Aluminium, but we do that within the Innovation Hub uh, as well. So the Innovation Hub is a, a platform uh, where a European Aluminium member on a voluntary basis can join, and uh, it's a platform to collaborate to have a more sustainable aluminium value chain. So we do that by mapping R&D challenges focused on topics such as uh, resource and circularity efficiency, energy use, flexibility and efficiency, and near zero emission technology. We are a bit of the interface between the uh, EU agenda and our members, and we do that by being part, for example, of private public partnerships such as Process for Planet, which are behind some of the EU code that you may be familiar with. Um, and um, we do as well this webinar or other action we have, we try to be a contact point between the R&D world from one side and, uh, and the industry uh, uh, on the other side. And this we do within the Innovation Hub, which I'm part of and which Christian is a, uh, is a director. As I said, European projects are a very important part of, um, of our work within the Innovation Hub. So here we wanted to highlight uh, all the projects we are part of. Uh, which are like following several parts of the aluminum value chain. And within this EU project, what we uh, mostly look at is, um, for example, policies uh, with the help of our colleagues of European Aluminium. We look at support for SCA kind of activities and we look at dissemination and communication. This is why we are as well behind the organization of this uh, um, webinar together with uh, uh, other partners of Salema. Um, I will not say too much about Salema because I think Manel will have a very extensive project, but just to give you really in a nutshell, what is Salema about? Um, Salema comes from the need for more sustainable transport, um, which will mean that will be more and more electric vehicles. And Patrick will, uh, will show us actually how much more aluminum we will have because of the, uh, the increase in, um, in electric vehicles. Now, because of that, um, we need to be sure that uh, what is Salema looking at is to be um, to increase the re reliance on primary critical raw materials, in particular uh, magnesium and silicon. Uh, so not only of aluminium, but as well on, on its alloys. Um, so uh, with this, I just want to have a, like, a bit of wrap up of uh, uh, some of the key questions we are trying to address today in, the, in this webinar. So which are the uh, key market challenges and opportunity for primary um, and secondary aluminum magnesium uh, for uh, uh, in the automotive? How much aluminum, as I said, will be used in the automotive industry? How much it's used today and how much will be used in the future? And uh, to, um, yeah, to, to see which are one of them some of the most important key collaborative research development uh, regarding the use of aluminium in electric mobility, which are done within the EU project. I will leave back the stage to Christian that will introduce uh, the first session. Okay, oops, I activate my camera. Hello, yeah, so thank you Francesca for, for this overview. Uh, yes, so I will uh, then introduce uh, the session one. We are still uh, on time, let's say, according to the uh, timeline. So, um, and it's my pleasure to have uh, to to welcome uh, Philip Meyer from uh, Novelis uh, to chair this this first session. So, Philip Meyer is the senior vice president and chief technology uh, technology officer at Novelis, having patience to grow the people and uh, push further the the limits. Uh, and in this position, is responsible for leading the company's product um, innovation. So. Uh, um, uh, and in charge of strategy and research and developments uh, across all regions. Um, in fact, uh, Philip joined Novelis with the company acquisition of uh, Aleris, and uh, prior uh, joining uh, Aleris, uh, he had the different uh, position R&D, operation and technology roles at Pechine and uh, Montupé. So, 
And um, it's clear that uh, within this 40 year career, he has been involved in the aluminium industry, serving the automotive, um, the aluminium cans, so the, the packaging, aerospace, and specialty markets. So he has a very wide, uh, let's say, expertise in the value chain. And, and obviously, he was uh, one of the, the big initiators of this innovation hub. So a few years ago, in 2015, so if the Innovation Hub is uh, here today, uh, it's clearly thanks uh, to this uh, commitment and it was a key enabler to this process. So thank you, Philippe, for that. Um, and, and you are the co-chair today of this Innovation Hub. So, um, so this is then the time to give you the floor. So please, Philippe, uh, I invite you to chair this first session, please. Okay, Christian, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction. And thank you also, Francesca, for setting the frame of all the activities of the European Aluminum about uh, circularity, sustainability, moving towards decarbonization, and in particular, uh, uh, reminding everybody how active the Innovation Hub uh, is indeed and how much it has grown uh, and, and to be really uh, now a, a key element uh, into uh, a decarbonization and bringing people together. So, uh, welcome to session one. Uh, session one is uh, setting the scene on the importance of aluminum in cars, critical raw materials, and uh, uh, having set this frame, uh, have a deeper dive also uh, into the Salema project. So, for that, we will have uh, three uh, speakers. Uh, first, uh, Martin Tauber. Martin Tauber uh, from International Magnesium Aluminum uh, Magnesium Sorry Association will deeper dive uh, into magnesium, uh, shedding light on the current challenges, but also uh, possible opportunities for for Europe. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Patrick uh, Ragnarsson uh, from the European Aluminium. and he will discuss around a, a very interesting uh, study centered on the aluminum content on uh, passengers' cars and uh, highlighting the uh, uh, current situation, the possible scenarios, and also uh, drafting uh, perspectives for the future. And uh, Manel uh, da Silva Lopez of Aerocat will present the Salema uh, project uh, uh, with a very nice overview of what, what has been done. Uh, just to comment on the Salema project, I think it is a very remarkable project because it shows uh, very clearly how uh, a wise uh, a selection of material, uh, a good optimization of the alloys, a good optimization of the process in link with design for uh, future utilization in perspective in particular of uh, designing parts uh, for e electric vehicles, uh, bringing all these elements together uh, uh, there can be a very significant impact on the uh, uh, reduction of uh, use of critical raw material, uh, increase the circularity, and also, uh, of course, uh, by doing that, move uh, towards uh, decarbonization in a very efficient way. I think it's a really nice illustration how bringing things together, uh, the impact can be really uh, significant. And um, now it's time for me to um, introduce uh, the first uh, speaker, so Martin Tauber from the European uh, uh, International uh, Magnesium Association. Uh, the presentation, I think it will uh, be visible to everybody, the presentation title is Primary and Secondary Magnesium Material Flows, Challenges and Opportunities. Um, while you load the presentation, I will give a little bit uh, more uh, detail about uh, Martin. So Martin Tauber has more than 25 years of experience in different raw material related uh, industries, uh, with magnesium being the most uh, significant one. He has held executive positions with uh, leading industry players such as Hydro, Magnesium and uh, Magontech. Uh, in 2009, he founded Foris, uh, which is a company that provides industry services on a global basis. He's also European representative and former chairman of the European Committee of the IMA, the International Magnesium uh, Association. And he's uh, president uh, of the Critical Raw Material Alliance. 
uh, he's also a registered expert at uh, the uh, at, um, at at the Euro. And so um, I think uh, Martin is very well uh, positioned to now give us uh, good insights on magnesium. So Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm just a little bit worried that uh, I do not uh, see uh, your presentation of on my screen. I hope uh, other participants can see it. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I shared the presentation. Good morning. Uh, is, it, is it okay? I, I cannot see it at all. Uh, if you want us, others can see it. We don't see it. If you want, we can share it uh, from our side. Yeah. Okay, but I, I, I still can scroll through the slides. I, I will need to do it myself. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, th thank you, Chairman, for the, the nice introduction. Thank you also, Francesca, and uh, 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 to to uh, to to uh, uh, to invite me, uh, I'm feeling a little bit like the elephant in the room because it's an, an aluminium uh, event. And when we heard the first about uh, the Salema project, we saw that uh, the, uh, one of the main objects is to reduce the use of uh, silicon and uh, magnesium, which of course alerted us a bit. Uh, but we learned in the meantime, and I think we agree on that we can or look for a kind of a beneficial coexistence, uh, I would say. And in uh, with this spirit, I also I think I will provide you a little bit more insight on uh, the value chain and on the the the, uh, the trade patterns of magnesium, uh, which is probably not uh, known by everybody uh, in uh, in this webinar. Uh, first of all, I think I would like to uh, say a little bit about the International Magnesium Association. Uh, it's a relatively old standing industry uh, platform, which was founded in 1943 in, in the States. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's consisting of the whole uh, magnesium value chain, starting with uh, primary producers uh, to uh, converters, OEMs, machinery producers, uh, but also the uh, scientific uh, a network, uh, a recyclers, and, and machinery suppliers. So the whole uh, value chain on a on a, on a global base. And as an association, we are providing different services to our members and stakeholders, and organizing uh, some conferences where I will uh, speak a little bit later on as well. Uh, just a similar slide to the aluminium uh, association, not so many members, but we are proud to have uh, uh, almost 50 members in uh, Europe. Uh, uh, very, act very active members in different in different uh, committees, and maybe you recognize some companies because most of the converters or die casters or casters are producing uh, aluminium parts uh, as well. Uh, these are some committees we are we are uh, working with our members. So the European Committee, uh, the Americas Committee, uh, China uh, Committee, because you probably know that most of the primary magnesium is coming from uh, China. Uh, in terms of uh, focus committees, we have of course the safety committee, which is also when you handle magnesium, you know that it's not so easy. Uh, to handle uh, on a safe way uh, magnesium, uh, very much in the focus uh, sustainability committee, because uh, also we have to decarbonize our value chain and also our contribution to uh, one of our biggest markets, which is still the aluminium alloying industry uh, and also in terms of uh, uh, recycling. Uh, a marketing committee, of course, uh, and we are having some dialogues uh, uh, here, uh, which is only a, a kind of a snapshot here. So we, our membership also consists of the uh, country or regional uh, magnesium associations, as the Japanese Magnesium Association, the Chinese Magnesium Association. Uh, of course, we're talking to you, European Aluminium, uh, MMTA, for instance, and, and actually, today in the in the afternoon, we are officially starting a magnesium chapter in uh, in India, which we also see as a as a growing market. Uh, first of all, I think 
what I would like to do is to put uh, aluminium and magnesium a little bit in perspective and show how relatively small we are. Uh, I think when you do this with the steel industry, you feel the same uh, like we feel comparing to, to aluminium. Uh, so I, I just uh, I picked up a few pinpoints here, if you like. Uh, when we look about primary production, uh, that uh, you know, you know that figures better than I am, but but I, I figured out that about 70 million tons on a, on a global base uh, compared to magnesium, which is only 1.13 uh, in 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 uh, last year. Uh, the Chinese uh, percentage in uh, uh, aluminium, I think, is 59 percent. Uh, and in magnesium, it's it's around 85 uh, percent, and the Western and Central Europe uh, percentage of primary production aluminium, uh, according to my figures here, was 4.2 percent. And uh, you see also the criticality assessment in Europe, uh, which puts the magnesium on the fourth edition of the uh, critical raw material list uh, as very as very critical because we have zero primary production in uh, in Europe. Uh, by the way, I think also that, uh, you know, that aluminium joined uh, the strategic raw material list, which was confirmed by the European Parliament just a few weeks ago. Uh, so both aluminium and magnesium are on the uh, strategic raw material list on the act. Uh, when we see about average <clears throat> plant size, uh, I would I would say that about 500,000 tons is a good figure for average uh, primary plant in magnesium uh, in in aluminium. Uh, there are probably larger plants already than 1.4 million tons, but you see that about one bigger aluminium primary plant is producing the whole uh, global market <coughs> of uh, of magnesium. Uh, for magnesium, because of the main main production is uh, happening in China. We have about uh, modern plants which have about 50 kilotons uh, as, a, as an integrated pigeon plant uh, and about the range of 15 to about 60, 65,000 tons as a, as a problem maximum today for an electrolytical uh, primary plant. Uh, in terms of carbon footprint, uh, the range in aluminium, you know that of course better than, than, than me, but it would say about 4 to 20 kilograms, uh, Europe is averaged uh, to 6.8, global 16.1. Maybe that's our old figures. Maybe they are, are new, uh, more uh, uh, CO2, a lower CO2 uh, available on the market yet. For magnesium, it's uh, according to an IMA study uh, uh, and 2020, we have uh, about 21.8 kilograms as an average for uh, the Chinese production, including credits. And the lowest uh, uh, electrolytical plant uh, in production today, uh, which I show later on as well, uh, is uh, about 7.8 uh, kilograms of CO2. Uh, for secondary production, I think we are using the same tagline like five percent of the primary production in kind of energy use and in terms of scrap uh, of course we have uh, in, in, in magnesium very well established production or post-industrial scrap as uh, some call it uh, we have limited access to post-consumer scrap because you know most of the magnesium which is used in, a, in an aluminium alloy is either staying in the aluminium cycle or is somehow demacked during the, uh, uh, the recycling process. So here we see still some room for, uh, for, for cooperation. Uh, in terms of uh, cyclability and CO2 footprint, I think the whole discussion about definition of, of post-industrial scrap and post-consumer scrap is very important. Uh, this is just some uh, trade figures. I, I think that's uh, an average of, 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 of several years. You see that China is producing, like I said, about uh, about 85, uh, 850,000 tons, exporting it to uh, to the whole uh, world. 
in principle, uh, some are, let's say, supply pat patterns, which are is really simple industry, I would say that virtually all metal produced in China and Russia are sourced in China and Russia, respectively. I think Russia is a special case since, uh, uh, since the uh, invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, all metal produced in USA are consumed in North America. Uh, the majority of imports into North America are coming from China via Canada, uh, because uh, North America has, of course, North America has an uh, uh, import uh, uh, duty of uh, 140 uh, percent uh, from 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 China. Uh, imports from Israel to the uh, to the U.S. market and uh, Russia, of course, lost its favorable status from I think six four percent to now 100 percent import tax. Uh, almost all magnesium produced in a prime in a in a in a in a primary facility in Brazil is used in Brazil. A few exports there as well. Uh, and the European market is dominantly uh, uh, dependent on uh, the imports from uh, from China. Also, Japan, for instance, and all the rest of the world market are, with a majority, uh, consuming uh, Chinese uh, metal. Uh, coming to the trade flows, uh, this is some figures from from Comtrade, which are publicly uh, available. Uh, just to give you a, a, a feeling about the, the amount, this is the, the, the value in US dollars. Uh, uh, 8104 is the uh, tax, uh, the, the, the trade code for magnesium in total. Uh, there are only five different uh, codes, uh, 80, 8104, 11 for pure magnesium, 19 for alloy, 24 uh, scrap and uh, 34 uh, powders and, 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 and other uh, like swarfs and so on and 90, 90 so 90 for products. Uh, what you probably know that we had a price peak at the end of 2021 uh, going into, into uh, 22. Uh, you see that here on the trade value which went up to more than 1 million uh, uh, one billion dollars uh, dollars here in 2022, uh, and here we have, uh, they say, summed up uh, European Union, Switzerland, Norway, and and UK. Uh, probably interesting for you is that the last line, uh, the line, the bottom line. Uh, if you look at 2022, uh, you see the allocation of the different uh, tax codes, uh, and there you see that with 46.5 percent. Still, the, the highest value is going into pure magnesium, which is mainly going into the aluminium and industry for alloying. Uh, if we look at the pure uh, magnesium import flow here, you see that the normal, let's say, import uh, value in uh, volumes in tons is about 80,000 tons uh, into, the, uh, into the European Union. Uh, we had also a quota of, of, of uh, I think, 80 or 85,000 tons uh, some years ago. This quota was one raised to 130,000 tons. Uh, so that probably explains the high number in, in 22, which is probably a reporting issue. Uh, so I'm not sure. It's rather difficult to investigate all the different uh, import uh, numbers from, from, every, from every country. Uh, but uh, if you see the, the first half of this year, which is not probably uh, been fully reported, but we are probably going back to the usual volume, uh, although the market's a little bit lower, so there may be an expectation of around uh, 65 to 70,000 tons of, uh, of import. Uh, if you look at the last uh, in the middle line and, 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 and the below uh, uh, box, you see that uh main volumes are coming from uh, from china with 78.1 percent and uh don't expect that in the netherlands or austria our primary production are just uh, uh, trader locations which uh, they, they are importing uh, this uh, but this is all china uh, material uh, i picked one example because uh it's a Norway as, as, as a typical primary aluminium producer country uh, and you see that also 
uh, the main imports with uh, more than 90% are coming from uh, China. Uh, talking a little bit about primary production, uh, there you see we have mainly the pigeon technology, which is a batch process uh, in, used in China, but also used in, in Turkey, for instance, or a, a modified process of this used in, uh, in Brazil, and the electrolytical technology, which is mostly comparable to an, an aluminium production, which is using mainly, mainly energy, and uh, is a continuous process. Uh, here are some of the, uh, the uh, most used or, or, or important different uh, ways of primary magnesium production. And there you see the, the, the left lines are the horizontal and the vertical pigeon process. Uh, and the horizontal is the, the most used in China. Vertical is still a little bit under development. We have an aluminium thermic process, which is probably an upcoming process also used in, in China and will be used in, 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 in projects in, in Europe as well. And then the classical uh, electrolysis process, uh, mainly from brine today, but there are also some uh, attempts to use uh, seawater as a, as, a, as a main raw material and, and with a, in combination with a desalination. Uh, what you probably see is that the different raw material is interesting for, for you. Uh, the pigeon process is using mainly as all using dolomite as the, uh, except the electrolysis, of course. Uh, but the main second uh, raw material for the pigeon process plants are ferrosilicon. Uh, so here comes the, 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 the silica as well. Uh, Interesting is also that those costs from a cost perspective are about 50% of the product costs comes from the uh, ferrosilicon input and more than 50% in China from the carbon footprint comes already with the uh, input material uh, ferrosilicon. Uh, so if you look at, for instance, at the carbon footprint, uh, I mentioned that already. So the, the horizontal and the uh, vertical pitching process uh, would be around 15 to about 20, 20 28. Uh, the aluminum thermic process is a very promising process because it has a, a rather low footprint because it can use electrical energy for most of the process. And it uses, instead of ferrosilicon, it uses aluminum scrap. Uh, about one ton, a little bit less than one ton for one ton of, uh, of magnesium, which can go down to a, a significant lower carbon footprint, uh, lower than five. Uh, so also in the neighborhood around uh, two. Uh, electrolytical processes, today we have with uh, five to, to 10 kilograms, maybe also some a little bit higher. Uh, this is, for instance, from a report which we are, uh, I think, one of some of you might have seen that already. We are uh, offering that to all our stakeholders as well. That's a primary tracking report where we monitor and track the different uh, named uh, carbon footprints of the different primary plants. Uh, and there you see, which I mentioned before, the lowest in production today is Dead Sea Magnesium, ICL Industries in Israel, uh, with a carbon footprint of around 7.8. And uh, there you see the indication of, for instance, for different projects which are in the pipeline uh, in Canada, in Australia, but also in Europe, uh, with one example, magnesium for Europe in Bosnia. And there you see that the uh, carbon footprint indication is around, is around 2 to 2.5. So it really could be a, a, a great step in the industry when such materials are uh, available in higher quantities for our industry. Uh, a little bit about China, because uh, I mean that's so our main our main market, and China will also uh, reduce the carb the carbon footprint. Uh, just a few snapshots here from a recent uh, report, a monthly report about China. Uh, so we know that there is a semi coke policy implemented uh, this year, and this will kind of maybe uh, disrupt the, uh, the, the the supply chain a bit because uh, semi coke furnaces have to be re removed, updated, and, and, and so on. 
uh, that we estimate a, a drop of around 17% from year to year uh, uh, compared to last year. Uh, there you also see that the exported uh, volumes, uh, here indication from January to August, are down, were down 25%. Uh, so the inventory, of course, went uh, are high. So it's a problematic year, and it, it's not it's not it's not over yet. Uh, uh, I would say so. We are, expect about 15% decline of the market uh, this year. Uh, now about uh, recycling, I think we have a similar recycling uh, setup. So we have uh, automotive related products, which have about 50% of uh, uh, process scrap rate, uh, and we have uh, like uh, what we call that 3C or 8C uh, castings for laptops, uh, computer housings, and so on. Uh, so there will be like like 80% or even higher uh, uh, as, uh, scrap. Rate. Uh, here's some material flow because uh, scrap. I think aluminium has some issue with scrap exports. We have that as well. It's not an issue, it's, it's a market-related fact that, for instance, the U.S. market is a higher-priced uh, market, so we have some uh, outflow of European scrap, uh, and you see that in the line of, in the third line uh, is, uh, for 22, it was about almost 6,000 tons of, of uh, scrap outflow, mainly into the uh, United States. Uh, the DERA in Germany, uh, published a, a recycling atlas, they call that, and there were some facts about magnesium as well. Uh, just uh, the, 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 the source will be in the presentation. Uh, I think the end of life uh, uh, recycling rate of uh, magnesium is a little bit in the neighborhood of, 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 of aluminium. Uh, I think it's less, less about 13, 13%. Uh, maybe interesting that, of course, we have different scrap classes. Here are eight uh, scrap classes, and we'll talk about process scrap. Then we'll talk about the first one uh, A, one B, probably uh, uh, two as well. But the main message is, uh, of course, that all scrap classes can be uh, recycled. Uh, I can't go very into detail about that, but we have a study available on our website which uh, has uh, investigated the main magnesium uh, recycling flows in, in Europe. Uh, so you see most of the imports. We have a functional recycling which stays in our industry. Then we have some uh, exports which are, which are the products, uh, some added on, on landfills, uh, some, some, some losses because of non-functional recycling. And in use accumulation is the, the, of course, the magnesium, which is still in cars or as an alloying element in aluminium parts uh, in the cars on the roads as well. Uh, of course, we see some uh, some opportunities uh, here as well with the new lips technology, line sorting technologies, where uh, you know the magnesium could be extracted um, in in a better way. Uh, what I wanted to mention is also that you see that as well, that, that OEMs are making uh, the scrap content of their products, used uh, material in their products as a marketing argument. So we see that as well uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in magnesium. Uh, and uh, also our industry is reacting to that. So we have, for instance, uh, uh, here, a, a product carbon footprint certificate from a Chinese uh, magnesium uh, producer, which uh, are offering uh, about 11 tons uh, CO2 material, which is an, 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 an a primary alloy uh, with a scrap content of uh, 40%. Uh, so this is, is quite new uh, offering from China to uh, global customers, also to European customers. And on the right side, you see a certificate about uh, one of our members, a uh, recycling company in the Czech Republic, uh, and uh, they are audited uh, uh, CO2, uh, it's about 2.4 CO2, a kilogram CO2 per ton recycled uh, magnesium. Uh, 
let me close with uh, the uh, opportunities and, and, and challenges what we see in, uh, in the future. Of course, uh, the Chinese energy market with access to green energy, the adoption to technology using that, that, that green energy, uh, the, uh, both for primary and, and, and secondary, uh, that the CO2 dominated purchasing from, from automotive so it's OEMs, but also from other CMs, so OEMs as a, as a must criteria. Uh, of course, some geopolitical trade uh, mechanism, not, not only protecting, but also as an opportunity uh, with alliances, uh, but also protection in terms of quota or the, the European planned uh, CBAM, uh, CBAM uh, scrap focus on circular and, and secondary uh, uh, chains, uh, alliances in the different industry, and there's also, I mean, alliances between the aluminium and the magnesium industry. About the green labeling uh, acceptance, like like your RC program, uh, and uh, also scrap definition and uh, flows. Uh, I want to make some uh, announcement as well. Use the last minute of my time uh, to invite you to uh, probably an interesting uh, webinar on the 25th of October for the challenge of uh, global magnesium primary production. Uh, with a couple of interesting uh, speakers. Uh, probably highlights are the update from China uh, uh, and a presentation from the lowest carbon footprint producer in Israel and also some outlook about the desalination project in used in Saudi Arabia uh, called the NEOM uh, project. And of course, I invite you to our annual flagship event uh, next year uh, in May in Fukuoka in Japan. Uh, so with this, uh, you can see our sustainability statement in the in the presentation. And with this, I thank you very much for your uh, for listening to uh, my presentation. And I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Very uh, interesting presentation, and uh, I, I'm sure it's also a good learning for many of us how you you move to uh, better CO2. Uh, uh, footprint, making use of uh, alternative technologies, but also recycling. So very interesting presentation. Uh, I just remind everybody that uh, please, uh, uh, there is the opportunity uh, to write your questions in the uh, Q&A box. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, but I do not see any question at this moment. I, I have one, of course, about uh, about magnesium, is there any uh, prime magnesium? Uh, is there any perspective to have some prime uh, production in Europe, uh, making use of uh, advanced technology and 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 proper energy? Uh, what what about such perspective, uh, Martin? Uh, the perspectives they're, they're always there. Uh... Uh, the European Commission last 21, uh, an ad hoc working group on bringing back uh, primary production to Europe. Unfortunately, there is not really a, one project brought forward and, and financed. Uh, I can say that there are three projects in the pipeline of AIRMA uh, for support. Uh, probably the most advanced, and I was part of a delegation visit with some uh, uh, friends and colleagues from, from the Commission and from AIRMA as well, uh, two weeks ago in Bosnia, where we saw the, the mine and, 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 and the, uh, the, the place where a, a, a primary production is planned using the aluminium, aluminium thermic process. So that's very promising. Uh, they will speak about 15,000 tons, probably upgrade to, to 30 or 45,000 tons. Uh, 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 earliest, I would say like 2025, there's probably uh, one source again. There is one plant in Turkey, uh, but unfortunately, the, the, uh, there is no almost no material coming to Europe because they all uh, in exported to the United States. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I just, I uh, I, there are two questions in the in the chat, but uh, maybe Martin can answer. Uh, yeah, I saw one question there. What is the share of the pitching process? So I think it's very easy because Chinese production is is uh, mainly working like 98 percent with with the pitching process so uh, uh, there's a pitching process used in in Turkey so I would say 90 percent of the global 
uh, supply coming from a pigeon, some kind of pigeon process. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think given the time uh, we have now to uh, to move to the next uh, presentation, and it's time for me to introduce uh, Patrick uh, Ragnarsson, is Director Mobility and Strategic Projects uh, at the European Aluminium. Uh, his presentation uh, will be about aluminium uh, recycling challenges, uh, challenges for uh, automotive alloys and, and also giving an industrial perspective. So a couple of words about Patrick. He joined the uh, European Aluminium in 2010. He's a doctor mobility and strategic project. Uh, previously worked uh, with vehicle acoustics uh, as a research fellow at uh, KU Leuven. He holds a Master of Science in Vehicle Engineering from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm in uh, Sweden. And uh, now, uh, Patrick, the floor is yours to, to drive, this, uh, drive us through this picture about uh, aluminum uh, recycling for automotive. Thanks a lot, Philip. Uh, just gonna share my slide here. And hopefully you can see it in full screen now. Is that okay? Yeah. Great. So thanks a lot for inviting me to this this uh, great webinar. Um, uh, it would be a pleasure to to present to you our latest study uh, that uh, we run every two three years. Uh, within the automotive and transport market group in European aluminium. Um, so I wanted to uh, divide this presentation up in a few parts. So first, I would like to go through the, the scope and the methodology on how we get together and, and do this, uh, this very, very big and, and comprehensive study every now and then. Uh, I will then go into the uh, automotive market assumptions because that's uh, very important to know what the bases are and what we assume for the future when we look at uh, the uh, aluminium content results later on. And I will then end with uh, some conclusions and, and uh, what we believe uh, will happen and what we believe the reasons for this uh, are for the future. So first of all, so like I said, every three to four years uh, in the automotive and transport market group, uh, we get together and uh, we um, hire a consultant called Ducker to uh, go through a really bottom-up study um, with uh, looking at what are the aluminium content in all vehicles that are put on or, or that are produced in Europe. Um, and the way that could do this is that uh, first of all it's it's a collaboration work with our members. So they sit sit down with all our members, uh, interview them thoroughly, uh, ask the members to uh, tell them where they believe there is aluminium, where they sell aluminium or, or ship aluminium to, and also try to quantify uh, the final weight of the component that goes into to each, each and every car. Uh, and we're covering all cars, all cars that are produced in Europe uh, in 2022 was included in, in this study. When we've done this first work, uh, Dacker then takes this huge um, matrix of, of information and go down to the OEMs and to the tier one suppliers and do the same process with them, try to fill in the blanks that we left, because we are not uh, delivering aluminium to all OEMs and, and definitely not to all uh, parts in the car. Uh, and then we do this back and forth a couple of times until uh, we filled uh, the matrix of aluminium components on one end and uh, the, uh, the cars that are produced on the other end. And they, of course, also need to talk to the OEMs about future perspectives. What do they believe will, ha will happen in the facelift of this model? What will happen in the next model that is not yet on the market, but will be on the market in two, three years? So it's a quite extensive work. And I think all in all, from start to finish, it takes somewhere between six and eight months to do this work. Um, the scope of the project uh, geographically is uh, EU27 plus UK, and, and we kept it like this because we wanted to uh, compare it with the previous study when we did when, when UK was also a part of the EU. Um, and we are looking at the passenger vehicles, uh, including all powertrain variants uh, on the market, um, all car segments, 
and all car body types, but, but we are excluding the light commercial vehicles. And they're not part of this scope. Uh, we're also looking at all uh, components, uh, but to make it a bit more easy to, to understand and easy to read, uh, we're dividing them up into component families. And you can see the list of the component families here. Uh, this does not mean that we only get numbers on these component families, so we are breaking up the component families into components. So in uh, closures, for example, we, we get separate uh, data for front doors, rear doors, uh, hoods, bonnets, etc. And we're also looking at all the product forms. So we, we get uh, split on, on every component into castings, sheet, extrusions and forgings. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of data coming into this, uh, coming out of this project. So to the vehicle uh, production forecast and, and uh, the statistics we're using, um, for us to, uh, to get good forecast and also to, to uh, translate the uh, component per vehicle into actual shipment and actual um, volume of aluminium going into this market, we need to know how many cars are produced every year. Uh, and as you are probably all aware of, uh, the last years has been a, a bit uh, chaotic. Uh, we started with the COVID uh, that made a huge drop between 2019 and 2020. And uh, when we then started to recover, uh, the Ukraine war came and, and um, all the problems uh, related to the semiconductor shortage, for example. Uh, this has caused a, a slower than expected recovery. And also we had to revise the numbers a bit after uh, the Ukraine war. So what you can see here is uh, the blue line is the, um, uh, the forecast we received from uh, the consultants uh, before the, the Ukraine war. And uh, the blue bars are the forecast uh, that we have now. Uh, that was the best we could uh, get when we started this project in September last year. Um, and as you can see here, we, we don't expect uh, the car production in Europe to get back to 2019 levels uh, before uh, 2026 at, at the earliest. That, that, that's what we believe now. Of course, also to make some uh, accurate assumptions of the future, we need to um, also assume something about the uptake of electric vehicles and other powertrain shares. Um, and we base this basically on that we believe that the car industry will live up to the CO2 emission target set by the EU. Which means that in 2025, uh, there should be a 15% reduction in carbon emissions uh, compared to 2021. In 2030, there will be a um, 55% reduction compared to 2021. And in 2035, there should be zero emission. And that that's uh, a part towards getting to uh, climate neutrality in 2050. So if we apply these numbers, what we believe is that, or what we know is that around 2022, uh, there is um, about 10% uh, electric vehicles uh, being produced in Europe. We believe that this will grow to 31% in 2026 and slightly over 60% in 2030. And if we would extrapolate even more uh, in 2035, we believe it to be close to 100 percent. Another important thing is to uh, to look at um, the split between different car segments. Uh, so we're splitting the car segments uh, between A and E, where E is the biggest and A is the smallest one. Um, an interesting thing to see here is that uh, the electric vehicles are generally located in a higher segment than the internal combustion engines. And this has an, a direct impact on the aluminium content, the average aluminium content of European cars when we move more and more towards electrification. We can also see that the electric vehicles are more prone to be, be located in the premium segment than in the volume segment than, than internal combustion engine driven cars. That also has an effect that we will see later. So down to the important things. So what does this mean for the aluminium content in cars uh, going forward? So here you can see a, a historical uh, view over uh, how the aluminium content has 
evolved uh, since 2006. Um, and also you can see that in 2006, we, we, uh, we uh, had about 121 kilos of aluminium per, per car. In our last study in 2019, we had 174 kilos. And in 2022, we're up at 205 kilos of aluminium per car. And we expect this to continue to grow and, uh, and reach uh, 256 kilos uh, per vehicle in 2030. So it's a it's a really it's a success story. I would say it's it's really a continuous growth. Uh, every now and then, the growth is a little bit slower, but uh, all in all, it's it's a really really impressive um, trajectory you can see here. So where does this aluminium come from? And here on this slide, I show you what will happen, what we believe will happen between 2022 and 2030. So all in all, we believe that the the average aluminium content per car will grow by 51.5 kilos. And of course, there will be some winners and losers. So if we start <laughs> from the losers, um, since we will go so much more into electrification, uh, there will be a loss of aluminium content in the powertrain and, and uh, the normal, the, the classic transmission components. We'll also see a slight decrease in thermal management. Um, but uh, if you read uh, the text below, that's not completely true. This, this is partly because of a decision we made in the project to put the, um, uh, the cooling plate of the batteries in the EV specific um, family. And that could also, of course, be put in thermal management. And if it would have been done that, uh, it would have been a, an increase of uh, three kilos instead of a decrease of 1.4. But the big winner between now and 2030 is, is definitely the EV specific component. I will later split, up, split that up so you will see what type of components, but it will be, I can already tell you that it's, uh, for example, battery boxes and, and electric motor houses that are the big winners. But there's also big uh, growth in body and whites and chassis enclosures. Um, uh, we will see um, a big uh, big growth in body and whites to lightweight the, the, um, the body, uh, mainly due to uh, that Electric vehicles in general are very heavy and you need to look at where you can lightweight cars to get a, a better range and, and um, so you don't need so, so huge batteries anymore. If you look at uh, the uh, split between uh, how the different uh, forming processes are growing, uh, this was uh, for me at least uh, one of the biggest surprises. I think in the last years we've talked so much about engine blocks are disappearing, um, transmission cases are, are disappearing. So what will this do to the casting business? Uh, but we will see that between now and 2030, casting is actually uh, the forming process that is, is growing the most in kilograms. Uh, so more than 22 kilos more castings in 2030 than what we have today. And this is mainly coming from that there is um, a lot of castings used for uh, the housing of the electric motor. And in electric cars, quite often you have two of them. So that's, that's a big volume. Uh, and we also see a trend from some OEMs going into uh, large and giga castings. Um, and that's something that we think will grow the, this content up even further. But we're also seeing a lot of growth in, in both sheets and extrusions of, of uh, 14 to 15 kilos each. Forging, which is a much smaller part of, of the total uh, in a car, is, is uh, not growing so much. So going back to 2022, uh, so what we said there is that we had uh, 205 kilos of aluminium in a car. Uh, and that is split then between 123 kilos of castings, 45 kilos uh, of sheet, 27 kilos of extrusions, and 10 kilos of forgings. So, of course, uh, the growth of, of uh, 22 kilos extra castings is uh, in uh, percentage wise, wise is not as big as for extrusions, for example. In extrusion, we will expect uh, a CAGR of 5.6% between now and 2030, which is uh, huge. So what is the reason for this um, 
this huge growth and and uh, will will this growth really continue as as we believe um well, to answer that question, it's, it's quite interesting to look at uh, what is the aluminium content and what will the aluminium content be in different types of powertrains. So I'll try to explain this slide for you because it's a bit complex, maybe. So you see the big number uh, on the left, that's 2022 um, average aluminium content. And based on the average aluminium content, you can then see the first bar is how much the, the average content of all pure ICE cars. So a pure ICE will have 36 kilos less than the average. And then we come to uh, the mild hybrids, they will have 54 kilos more. The full hybrids have 49 kilos less than uh, the average. And the plug-in hybrids have 72 kilos more and the battery electric vehicles have 78 kilos more. So, what you can see here is that at the moment, of course, it's really positive for the aluminium industry, the more electric cars that are put on the market. The reason why it's such a big difference between uh, the average and the electric vehicles today is that, like I said earlier, most of the cars, most of the, of, of the electric cars that put, is put on the market today are the premium segments and higher, um, higher segment cars, so the D and E segments of the cars. Uh, this will slightly change by time, is what we expect. So you will see that uh, the electric vehicles will more and more migrate down to to, uh, to smaller and more average cars. And of course, when we when we hit 2030, uh, as we will have 60% battery electric cars, uh, the the average uh, aluminium content in cars will be more or less made up by the content of the electric cars. It will have a much bigger impact of the, on the, uh, the average than today. So the difference between the average and the uh, electric cars will be, will be smaller in um, 2030. But even then, uh, we still believe that electric cars will have much more aluminium in them than, um, than any car that has uh, some kind of combustion engine. There's another slide also to show the importance of the, the higher segments. So on the left side here, you can see the A, B, C, D, E and F segments where F is the biggest. Um, and today, uh, the dark blue uh, bar here, you can see that the average F segment car has almost 500 kilos of aluminum, uh, while the average market is 205. So the average market size today is somewhere between a uh, C and D segment. On the right hand side, you can see a similar slide, but just showing the evolution of uh, the different forming processes. So showing that you will see uh, a very big or good growth in all forming segments or forming processes, except for forging where we think uh, it's more or less matured and, and you use forging where in the same place as, uh, as you've done for many years. So going back to look at the um, component families again. Uh, so here you have the forming, uh, the component families uh, uh, listed in the bottom. And you can see the evolution where the, the, um, the light blue is 2019, the dark blue Darkest blue is, is uh, 2022, and then you have a middle blue, which is 2026, and the gray one is 2030. Um, so highlighting a few of the, the biggest changes, you can see, of course, like I said before, powertrain going down from 42 kilos uh, to 14 kilos per vehicle, transmission going down from 19 to 11. But the big winners are the EV specifics, where uh, in 2022 we had seven kilos per car going up to more than 70 kilos per car in 2030 and body in white uh, reaching uh, 44 kilos per car in, in uh, 2030. So you will get these slides later so I will not go through through all the numbers you can look at them yourself later. Also here uh, a note about um, uh, thermal management so as you if you look at the, the bars here, it looks like thermal management is slightly decreasing. 
uh, but if you would include uh, the um, the cooling plates in the battery, uh, it will actually be a growth. What we also did was uh, not only look at the uh, content per vehicle uh, that you have on, on the left hand side. That's the numbers I, I went through already before. But we also want to see what the, what this means for the industry as a whole. What, how much aluminium do we have to ship to the automotive industry to fulfill this? So basically, multiplying the uh, aluminium content per vehicle with the production numbers, and then also adding the scrap rates. Because specifically for sheets, for example, um, if you sell aluminium for a car door, you're not just shipping the aluminium that goes into the car um, in the on the street. You're also shipping the, the sheet that is used to stamp um, this door. So it's in a in, in a door case, it could be uh, sometimes quite, quite close to 50, 55% of scrap being generated when you stamp the door. Uh, so on the right hand side, we've added this, the scrap rate for every individual component um, that we made assumptions for how, how big the scrap rate is. Uh, both for uh, extrusions, sheet and castings and forgings, and then adding up the numbers to a growth, uh, gross aluminium demand. Uh, and then we can see that in 2022, the, the gross aluminium demand is close to 3 million tons. And then due to the two, two effects, both uh, a, a big growth in content per vehicle, but also a growth in production between now and 2030, this will grow to almost 5 million tons. So the gross demand will grow by by almost 2 million tons between now and 2030. So that's, that's a big, big change that the industry need to be prepared for. And um, hopefully uh, we will make sure that most of this will come from European production because we also know that uh, that's much, much more sustainable than importing it from other regions with, with much less uh, care about the, the environment that we have in, in Europe. So my final final two slides will be a kind of a summary of of, uh, of the study. The first slide here is showing the winners uh, in terms of additional aluminium content between now and 2030. Uh, and the big winner is, like I said earlier, the e-drive housing. Uh, it will add 22.7 kilos between now and 2030. Um, the runner-up is uh, the battery pack housing, uh, where we'll have 11.8 kilos more in 2030. And then an interesting development uh, that we saw in this study is uh, large and mega castings. Um, this will be used in like big uh, full floor structures or rear structures of cars, for example. We know already that uh, Tesla and Volvo are two companies that are talking a lot about this. Uh, and, and we'll use it in the future. Uh, ballistic protection is another uh, component that is important. It's a, it's a plate sitting under the battery, protecting it from intrusions from, from below. And then battery cooling plates, also a very important aluminium component in, in future cars. So some final considerations. Um, well, first of all, I've said it many times, it's it's a continuous growth. It's, it's an impressive growth between now and 2030. Um, and there are new applications that, that is driving this growth. Uh, we are not relying anymore on huge volumes going into to, um, cast engine blocks. Uh, we need to do a lot of work on making sure that uh, the aluminium is fit for purpose in, in all the new aluminium components going into electric cars. Um, it's basically driven by regulations. The EU has set very strict emission targets for the future, uh, going to zero emission cars by 2035. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge change for the car industry and they, they need to act quite fast because it's not too many years until they need to have sw swapped their entire production to electrification. Um, and we can see that electrification really benefits aluminium. Uh, there is a lot of uh, components in electric vehicles where aluminium uh, is, a, is a perfect fit at the moment. Um, and we can also see that uh, it's not only these new components that are important, it's also uh, lightweighting that is driving the aluminium growth. Um, 
the electric cars are very heavy because you have a big battery and to, to keep them drivable uh, to uh, Im improve the range uh, light rating is still a, a, a key to uh, designing a good vehicle um, yeah there has been in the past and there will probably be in the future uh, some supply chain disruptions disruptions um, and other things uh, and we've seen that that has an impact on uh, on the industry and and that that's also probably making some of our assumptions obsolete in the, in a few years but this is what we can do now we saw in the last uh, crisis that OEMs um, when they had supply chain, chain disruptions they prioritized larger and higher margin car models uh, and that had a positive effect on aluminium because as I said before the larger segments had more aluminium in them um, we have seen a slower recovery than expected after COVID, uh, mainly due to the Ukraine war. Um, and we don't expect 2019 levels to be back until 2026, as I said. Um, but with all these positive things that said now, we, we are expecting a big growth of aluminium, of course, but uh, I don't think uh, we, can, we can rest assured that this will actually happen unless we uh, continue to in innovate. And that's... Uh, also uh, a perfect fit with this uh, webinar I think it's important that we stay competitive uh, there are many other materials not only magnesium I think steel would probably want to have a big piece of this market as well uh, so we need to be in the forefront and continue to innovate and show the OEMs that aluminium is still the material of a choice for their cars and we also need to focus a lot on sustainability because we see a huge focus on this from the OEMs talking much more now about recycling talking much more now about low carbon aluminium uh, so these two things uh, are, are really areas where we need to focus a lot in the future to stay competitive and to stay the material of choice for the automotive industry for electric cars that's all I had uh, today I'm happy to take questions if there are any yeah, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for this nice presentation. I think it really highlights how aluminum is well adapted to the needs for decarbonization. But I also like your last comments. Uh, we are in a tough competition uh, against other materials, so nothing is really given. It's up to us to make it happen. But really nice uh, perspective. Um, I, I do not see specific questions in the q and I I asked, by the way, people to, to write them down. Um, in, in between, maybe we're a little bit short in time, but just one uh, question about this growth of aluminum demand in Europe. How do you see that uh, happening in terms of supply? How can uh, Europe uh, not rely uh, too much on, on imports? Uh, what, what is this perspective uh, to, to ensure this growth of aluminum uh, application? Yeah, <laughs> good. Good question. I, I, I wish I would say that uh, we will start investing in a lot of new production and uh, that uh, the politicians in Europe uh, made sure that we had cheap energy. So that was a good business case. Uh, I don't think I would be reliable if, if I said that, uh, but that's what we're hoping for. Um, I think, first of all, I mean, recycling is something we, we already do a lot in Europe, and I think that's something we will continue to do. Yeah. Um, I also think that when it comes to semi-finished production, we are very strong in Europe as well, and we have good relations with the OEM. So I think there, um, it would be a bigger step, I think, for the OEMs to start importing uh, aluminium sheets from China than uh, than importing aluminium components for 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 less complicated products. So I think I think we are we are pretty good place there. Um, and I also think that the more focus there will be from the OEMs on sustainability, I think the, the, that will also move, move the focus from regions that are producing a lot of aluminium with high carbon content. Uh, we need to make sure that legislations and, and uh, life cycle assessment methodologies are taking this into account. Um, and not only uh, assume that all aluminium is the same. Yeah. Um, so it, it's important to, to really dis Distinguish between aluminium, aluminium coming from China and aluminium produced in Europe. 
not only carbon footprint, but there is a lot of other sustainability criteria where we are better than them. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patrick. Very nice perspective, very nice presentation and, and good highlights on what remains to be done. But uh, obviously we have we have the tools, the competencies to, to, to make that happen. Thank you very much. Very nice message. Thanks and, a lot. Uh, now I want to introduce the third uh, speaker, so Manuel uh, Da Silva Lopez. He's head of the Light uh, Alloy Research Line and, at uh, uh, Eurocat. And he's also the uh, technical coordinator of the Salema project. And uh, uh, his title is uh, Salema New Aluminum Alloys for Circular Electric Mobility. And as I earlier said, I think it's a very nice uh, project. So I'm eager to, to see what you will tell uh, about that. So Manel, um, uh, more precisely, is the head of the light alloy research line in the unit of metallic and ceramic material uh, of Eurocat uh, Technology Center in Catalonia. Uh, he is also, as I already pointed out, a technical coordinator of the Salema project. He has more than 15 years of experience in research projects related to high pressure die cast and processing of aluminum alloys, working at CEIT at Coural, uh, located at the University of Quebec the ASCAMM and Eurocat. He has participated in uh, 10 European projects, um, being the technical director of four of them. And this is in addition of uh, numerous uh, national projects. He's the author or co-author of 13 uh, articles in uh, indexed scientific journals and over 20 communications in national and international uh, conferences. Uh, so Manel is also a PhD in material science, uh, earned at the University of Navarra in 2006. And now uh, the floor is yours to tell us uh, about Selima. OK, thank you, Philip, for the well, this presentation and especially for the very kind words for Selima project. I agree with you that I think it's a good project. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the kind words. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. You can hear me well. Everything's yes. fine. OK, so I will go on. Uh, so my presentation today is entitled with new aluminum alloys for circular electric mobility. And what I will try to do is to show you in 20 minutes, that it's very short time, the the results, well, an overview of the Salima project and uh, some some results. We already get it. So the structure of the presentation, I will start uh, showing the project goals and the approach we are following in Salema. How we are contributing to circular economy and to reduce the CRM uh, the demand in Europe. The pilots and demonstrators we are going to use in Salema for uh, for assessing the new alloys develop the consortium and project structure, and then I will show you uh, results in two different fields: the scrap sorting system, that it's a key point we think in being able to recycle aluminium, end of life aluminium, and to be able to produce high quality aluminium alloys, and then the procedure we have followed on alloy development as 20 minutes is short time. I have focused just in one of the processes we are targeting in Salema in high pressure recasting. And then I will finish with uh, next steps. So uh, the European Green Deal is posing a well, contradictory challenge, let's say. So on one hand, we need new high performance and lightweight materials. And at the same time, we need to decrease the dependence on imported raw materials. And to have both together, it's yeah, quite quite difficult, quite challenging to increase the amount of high performance materials without importing them. And in order to uh, well to go towards that that direction, Salema is applying well, it's trying to develop a non-CRM dependent aluminum ecosystem. And we are exploring two different approaches. One is uh, by substituting 
the elements that are considered critical raw materials, as we saw in the first presentation with magnesium, by other elements or by decreasing the amount present in, in aluminum alloys. And the second approach is by obtaining these critical raw material elements from domestic scrap, so harvesting them from, from the scrap already uh, existing in Europe. Because as also in the first presentation was said, there is a, well, a missing uh, flux of a scrap, a flow of a scrap going uh, outside Europe in case of aluminium, mainly to, to Asia. And well, we need to to improve the recovery of this aluminium, end of life aluminium that we are missing right now. So regarding the first first approach, uh, so here you have the uh, well, the chemical table, so the the table with all the elements on the periodic system, and uh, they are point out the three materials, three elements that are considered critical in the last list that are present in aluminum alloys. One is magnesium, that has been already explained. Another one is silicon, that is also present in a lot of aluminum alloys, 6000 series, and especially in casting alloys, there is always quite a lot of silicon, high pressure casting alloy. And also in the last list in 2020, but also in the list that came this year, that it's not in, in this periodic table, 2023, but bauxite is considered as, uh, as a critical raw material. So we need to, well, so the, the first approach is trying to the, decrease the amount of these elements present in the alloys. Okay. And regarding the second approach, what we are doing, it's going to the end of life scrap. So one, we are focusing on uh, on the car industry. So once the car is uh, dismantled, just the, the end of life car that it's uh, shredded and on this uh, a stream of mixed components that it's called Zorba, we are looking to extract, to separate segregate the, the different uh, kind of materials and the different aluminum alloys in order that we are able to recover from this low quality scrap that usually it's sent outside Europe. Uh, we are able to recover high performance scrap that can be used to produce uh, high quality aluminum alloys. So that's very important to segregate and well to uh, control the composition of this scrap before going into the in the aluminum production again in the recycling process. And to assess the quality of the alloys developed, we are working on four different pilots, four different processes, high pressure recasting, cold and hot stamping of aluminum sheet, and aluminum ex extrusion. And we are going to develop five different demonstrators, a shock tower, that is the most common uh, element produced right now by high pressure recasting, uh, a structural element produced by high pressure recasting. Then uh, we are also producing a frontal frame by high pressure recasting mixed together with extrusion. This is a combined component that combines two different technologies, two elements produced by two different technologies. And then by cold stamping, we are producing body and white parts, actually a door to two different parts, an, an inner part and an outer part of a, of a door. And by hot stamping, we are producing a B-pillar, mock-up of a B-pillar. And then by extrusion also, we are producing uh, extruded profiles for a battery box. And well, here in this infographic, you can see better where are placed the different components and they are all present in the electric vehicles. There is a specific component for electric vehicle that is this battery box housing, but all the other are components that can be present in any kind of vehicles that are related to the body and white and the structure of the vehicle. So, and 
regarding the structure of the project, we are targeting three different processes as we saw earlier. High, high pressure recasting, a stamping and extrusion. And for each of these process, we have three blocks. We have a material developer, that it's a company that is working on aluminum production, on well, the production of alloys for this specific process. Then there is a, a research institution working, assisting the alloy development but also on the process optimization and the validation of the lines. And then finally, the manufacturing, the companies that are going to assess the, the performance of these alloys on full industrial scale. For instance, for high pressure recasting, we have rough metal as uh, aluminum supplier, a fellow developer. Eurocata University of Padova, we are working on the well, assisting rough metal on the alloy development and also the final uh, end users on the production of the lights. And the, and the end users, the foundries that are endurance overseas and Favor Ederland, that it's well, working under the supervision of Ford. Okay. And well, we have the same for the stamping and for extrusion with different partners. And there is also two partners that are closing the loop, University of Liège and Comet Treatments that are working on recycling and provision of raw materials and developing a sorting, uh, a, a sorting equipment to, to sort the scrap, or minimum scrap. And also other partners that are giving uh, well, external advice or uh, assisting us in other aspects, as can be a standardization policy guidelines of communication, as European Aluminium, SE, and UNE. Okay, so uh, regarding the results, I will start explaining what we have done in aluminum scrap sorting, as I think it's one of the key points in order to be able to improve the amount of a scrap that it's being recycled in Europe. And what we have done on University of Liège and Comet has developed this prototype where there is first one step of uh, sensors, high tech sensors and cameras that uh, are focusing each, in each single element of the scrap. And they are getting information about the size, the, well, the position, and especially the chemical composition, but by the leaps. Then there is a process of data fusion. Well, all the data uh, provided by these sensors is gathered together. A process of uh, well, artificial intelligence, so a model that is uh, combining all this data in order to get a picture of the object. So a picture, I mean, uh, a whole information of what this object attributes. And then, there is a uh, robotic, uh, several robotic arms that are sorting and well, placing the, the scrap fragment in the corresponding box. Uh, so the main equipment of this uh, of these prototypes is the lips, and the lips is well, based. It's a laser. The sample surface is excited by by the laser. The laser briefly creates or increases the temperature and creates a plasma, and the plasma emits light that it's then uh, well, um, it's absorbed or detected with by a spectrometer that gives a, a spectra that is then analyzed and converted into chemical composition. Okay, and that's the key point of the of the system be able to, from this kind of spectra, uh, predict to which uh, composition uh, belongs the spectra. And for that, we have well, been working together and provide uh, samples with known chemical composition to be able to tune, better tune the model. 
And here you have a short video. I have been told earlier that there is some lag. I hope that well, you can see at least have a good idea what we are doing. So there is first, uh, what well, you can see, a uh, role to place the parts distributed among these transport belt, and then there is a laser analyzing all the well, the chemical composition of each single element, and then these robotic arms that are placing the part into the right part. And that's, well, the a stage of development that there is this prototype, this picket prototype right now. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. That's regarding the sorting. I, I will also, as I mentioned before, show some details on the alloy development process and the situation we are right now for high pressure recasting. For the stamping and extrusion, we have done similar work, but as there is no time to explain all of them, I have been focused. I, I have focused in one single process, the pressure recasting, and provide a better, better overview. So regarding the development of alloys with reduced CRM content, what we have been done is to analyze the criticality index. We have defined, well, it was defined in a previous project, an index that uh, gives a value of how much critical elements has this alloy. And also, we have uh, evaluated the uh, the castability and the, the performance of the alloy. So not just, of course, uh, we are not just looking to reduce the critical raw materials, but also to have high performance alloys, because it will be very easy not to use any critical raw material and produce just uh, low, well, low quality uh, alloys. So. And with all this information, we have worked on uh, well, simulating the performance of different set of alloy families with different chemical composition. And we have well, the values for the criticality index, yeah, the castability of the alloy, and a balance. And with that, we have selected the better balanced alloys, so the alloys that perform better with a lower criticality index. Okay. And right now we are working on further on this on these alloys that were selected under this uh, score balancing the testability or the processability and and performance and the crit criticality okay and that's regarding the design of new alloys with reduced CRM content regarding the uh, development of uh, High performance alloys for high pressure recasting for structural components with a large amount of recycled content. What we have done is to work on improving the the well on increasing the amount of of impurities of undesired elements in order to make it easier to be produced with a scrap and we have done first, as first stage of development, uh, analyze the fluidity of these alloys. So how it are going then to perform uh, so in high pressure decasting process, so the castability of these alloys, and also the presence of uh, undesired microstructure or also we have checked the mechanical properties, but just in, by putting it like that in, in permanent mode casting. We have worked first 
on 15 different alloy variants with different amount of magnesium to different levels, about 0.3 and about 0.15 magnesium, so medium and low magnesium content. And then what we have worked on is on trying different, so on increasing the amount of impurities of undesired elements. Together with uh, Rag Metal, with the alloy developer, we detected the most critical elements in order to get the easily the alloy with a uh, large amount of scrap or copper. It because well the standard gives a very reduced uh, uh, amount of alloy copper below it, it should be below 0.03. So we have in some alloy variants increased it up to 0.15%. And also work with iron by increasing it to up to almost 0.3% of iron. And with zinc, which is also quite restrictive. And what we have observed is well, the impact that this, the increase of these undesired elements has on fluidity. So we have shown, for instance, that zinc decrease quite a lot fluidity that yeah we get about half the fluidity values that we have in a standard alloy without any zinc and we have also checked the uh, impact in mechanical properties which we didn't show any any clear trend any impact clear impact in mechanical properties and also in the microstructure, we didn't detect any change in phases with these changes in copper and zinc. Okay, that is the example of the first five uh, alloys that we tested, alloy variants we tested. And right now, the, we have selected from these alloy variants four of them to be further tested in. Well, for the demonstrator production, and we have already worked on the first alloy variant, getting quite good properties and yeah, just well, and nice parts, and that's the status we are working right now. We are already on the on the, the industrial validation of this alloy development. And just to finalize my presentation, I'm going to explain the next step. So right now we have started the production of shop towers with the first of the variants, and they are being produced right now, the rest of the line variants. Okay, one of them is uh, already produced and they are sending to, for the heat treatment. We are going to start uh, by end of October with the production of the other uh, demonstrator, the frontal frame mockup, with the selected alloy variants. And once we have all these two demonstrators produced, we are going to characterize tensile, fatigue, toughness, welding, and corrosion properties of all the alloy variants test. For the stamping, we are also working on it. We have started the first uh, production of the of the hot stamping component, the D-pillar mockup, and we are well, going to conclude this production and working with the different alloy variants. And we have well, we are going to start shortly also the production of the cold stamping demonstrator, the two door parts. And for extrusion, we are a little bit behind right now. We are uh, manufacturing the dies. And shortly, we expect before the end of the year, I start with the testing of the different uh, alloys selected, that in this case are three different alloy variants that we are going to use to produce the two demonstrator. And well, that's all from my side. I try to be brief. I don't know if I exceed my time. Hopefully. Well, thank you very much, uh, Manel. Uh, good, good, good timing.
Um, I, I have some issues refreshing the Q&A and the, the new post. So I, I turn to you, uh, Francesca. Um, are there questions uh, from the audience? No, there is no question in the Q&A. So I, I may have one just uh, to uh, to give perspective. So how do you see uh, the follow up of Salema? So we understand we still have to, to do some work. You will do this. And um, my question is more about uh, is there a perspective in terms of um, alloy uh, standards, uh, for example, or specific uh, applications uh, uh, to to be promoted uh, as a consequence of the Salema project? Yeah, well, so our intention is once the alloy are developed, tested and validated, try to include them in the in the corresponding standard and for the mm -hmm. reason, in the consortium, there is UNE, that it's the a Spanish normative body. And also, well, European Aluminum for assisting us on, on such a thing. Right now, what, well, we are already working on a UA, on a standard, well, let's say it's half a standard, for the uh, fluidity test, which is something that is not available, so there is lack of a standard for uh, a live fluidity test, and especially for fluidity tests that it's reliable for high pressure recasting performance. So the mostly used fluidity test is the spiral test, and it predicts pretty well the performance of the alloy uh, on gravity casting. But for high pressure recasting, well, there are several well, in, in literature can be revealed that the correlation between the performance of an alloy and high pressure recasting is not related with the fluidity you get in the spiral test. And with this method we develop, we see a much better correlation and we are working while well, it's uh, still not published, so <laughs> just keep it secret we are working on on a standard for yeah, for this fluidity test to, to predict the performance of high pressure recasting of flowers okay thank you very much uh, nice presentation and uh, that's the opportunity also uh, to thank uh, all all of you uh, the three presenters i think it, it was a nice uh, landscape presentation and, and good perspective uh, we have a little bit eaten uh, a portion of the coffee break so i, I turn to you uh, uh, christian um, to to manage the, the coffee break and the next uh, portion of the sessions yeah okay thank you philippe and thank you to all speakers i think we had very interesting presentations so thanks for that hello good morning again so I think it's 11.30 now, uh, we should restart uh, the webinar. Um, so I hope you had a good break and you managed to get some coffee. Um, so now for the second part, which is more uh, looking at cross fertilization and looking at other uh, project, uh, new projects. Um, so we will have a new, a new moderator, a new chair. So uh, it will be Carla Barbati. So Carla is from Constellium. Uh, she's metallurgist, um, and she's uh, since uh, 2019. Uh, Research Manager at Concilium University Technology Center. I have understood that this is in collaboration with Brunel University, so located in, in UK. Um, I have seen that Carla has been uh, started her career in the steel industry, then moved to aluminium. So, and she had uh, various uh, activities, also including uh, activities in CTEC. Uh, let's say uh, the. Um, technology center of Constellium and, and move in different areas, uh, uh, especially in the Department Automotive Structure and Industry within uh, Constellium and uh, active in different uh, research program also with universities. So I think from this experience, uh, Carla is really well positioned to chair this uh, type of uh, session. So please, Carla, the, the floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you very much, Christian. Thank you for a very kind invitation and the, and the introduction. I also like to, to, to thank Francesca for the opportunity for moderating this um, session in this very interesting webinar where we are highlighting lots of uh, the things around aluminium, the potential for its application for the light weighting and its role in our sustainability agenda. So I'd like to introduce uh, the, this session by highlighting the uh, our speakers and uh, also looking, uh, th that's going to be an opportunity to look into specific European funded projects where aluminium again has a, a critical role in um, in, the, in the future mobility. So uh, we're going to have Lucia Barbo from the CIMNE talking about aluminium innovation uh, for the EV uh, chassis component. So this is within the project Fatigue for Light. And this project is aiming at developing new tests and computer simulation methodologies for electrical vehicle chassis uh, for weight reduction. And also they are uh, pretty much looking into the application of new materials and among them uh, high strength um, aluminium. Then we're going to have Alvise Bianchi from MBN talking about the Flamingo project. And this is a project where I'm also a partner. We consider also a partner in the project. And this project is aiming at developing lightweight aluminum metal matrix nanocomposites and validating for all those uh, materials and components in green vehicles. So we are looking to the, the efficient production of high performance of uh, lightweight uh, aluminum nanocomposites. Uh, and the, the and how we can you know produce those uh, you know, aluminium uh, for automotive parts. So it entails quite a lot of challenges. Uh, obviously, I'm pretty sure we'll talk about them in terms of uh, uh, the metallurgical concepts uh, for integration of the nanoparticles. And finally, we're going to have a highlight of the Flash Flex Crash project, which is aiming uh, to uh, developing a new generation of crash tolerant structures. And we're going to have as a speaker Sergio Pereira Oriol from Iricat and Anthony Jerry Mechalka from Gestamp. So I would like to proceed and introduce uh, our first speaker for for, for the uh, the first uh, the next uh, session. So Lucia. So the title of her presentation is Aluminium Innovation for EV Chassis Component Hybrid Solutions Developed in the Fatigue for Light Project. And um, I'd like to say a few words about Lucia in terms of her background. So Lucia is an assistant professor at the, Polyte the Polytechnic University of Catalonia and an assistant research professor at the International Center for Numerical Methods Engineering uh, in CIMNE in Barcelona, Spain. So the Current, she's leading the research unit on constitutive modeling of nonlinear processes with a special focus on fatigue. Um, so, please, um, uh, Lucia, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the kind presentation. I hope I shared my screen. Yeah, I did. Okay. Okay, so from my side, today I'm representing uh, the Fatigue for Light project, even though we have these technical difficulties. Um, so uh, we are dealing in the Fatigue for Light project with fatigue modeling, some fast testing methodologies, uh, because we want to optimize part design and to boost lightweight material deployment on chassis parts. And specifically in my talk today, um, I want to, to focus it or to highlight the aluminum innovation that we had on electric vehicle chassis components through the hybrid solutions that we developed in the Fatigue for Light project. Uh, and regarding my talk today, um, it's structured in, in, in such a way in which I will begin explaining by uh, what, what is the general overview of our project and our consortium. I will share with you very briefly the project phases and what is the research beyond the state of the art that we are pursuing in the project. Um, then I will speak about what are the materials that we are focused on analyzing uh, in the particular project. And I will finish with uh, a very brief overview because of the time um, on the result that we've been achieving in the project at material level, lab scale demonstrator and also industrial demonstrator. Um, OK, so now I'm going to go to to the slide on the fatigue for light general overview and just to give you some some information about our project. Uh, it's a three year duration project um, funded under the Horizon 2020 program. 
uh, we are close to the end of, uh, of the time for our project. We are finishing the work because we are going to end the project uh, at the end of December, at the end of January, sorry, 2024. Um, and we've been funded with 5 million euros by the European Commission. We are 13 different partners from four different European countries. Um, and the coordinator is uh, THIMNE, which is the International Center for Numerical Methods in Engineering uh, here in Barcelona, Spain, which I'm representing today. Okay, now uh, an overview uh, on our consortium. Uh, we have four different types of partners here. We are three research institutions, which is our CIMNE, Eurecat and RISE. We have three universities involved, Alulia University, Politecnico di Torino, and the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, UPC. Also, we have six industrial companies. Um, we have uh, Fiat, uh, CRF, Magneto Wheels, ArcelorMittal, Gestamp, Hartec, um, Profil Glass, which is an aluminum supplier, and Composite Service Europe. And we have one standardization body to help us with, uh, with uh, standardization issues, which is UNE. Okay, now, um, if I want to humanize a little bit our consortium, here you can see the evolution we've had through the years while we were working on the Fatih for Life project, going from the, the online, let's say, uh, meeting mode into the in-person meeting mode. Um, finally, after the COVID pandemic. And you can see that we've got only grown more beautiful with the years, <laughs> not any fatter, not any white hairs, uh, just wiser and more beautiful, okay? Uh, now, regarding the, the project phases in the Fatigue for Life, um, the project is structured in such a way that we, we devoted the first year of the project to uh, studying the material behavior uh, at coupon scale. After that, we went to a large scale demonstrator where we focused our, our effort in the second year of the project. And now in the third year, we are intensely focused on analyzing the behavior at, uh, at component level at industrial demonstrator. And uh, in, in the project, we followed uh, such a timeline uh, that uh, we began by studying the, the, um, the performance, the mechanical and also the, the environmental performance of uh, different types of steel, also aluminum, also multi-hybrid uh, uh, multi-material hybrid solutions. Uh, after that, we, we dedicated a lot of effort to developing um, experimental tools for light weighting. Uh, and specifically, our, our project is, is very, very focused on, on fatigue, so behavior under cyclic loading. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, a fatigue testing campaign, for instance, is, is a very lengthy and costly uh, procedure. So uh, um, if you can uh, develop new experimental tests that can help you save time and save money, that is a, a very big added value for uh, for all the industries, I would say, where fatigue is a problem, obviously for the automotive industry also. Um, after that, we, we um, again, uh, set up to work on computer and simulation methods, uh, specifically uh, the oriented, let's say, to better estimating the fatigue life of chassis components. And uh, with, with these tools uh, helping us to select the optimal materials for lighter uh, chassis components, and then we wanted to bring all of these different um, building blocks, I would say, that we developed in the project to a component scale and validating um, the solutions developed at lab scale and industrial scale. Okay, um, next, just to speak about the research beyond the state of the art. Um, here, uh, the, the focus in our project was, uh, was developing a, a fatigue computer simulation method which uh, was comprehensive in the sense that it took into account all of those um, nonlinear effects induced by the manufacturing processes. And here I mean uh, manufacturing processes such as cold stamping, hot stamping, uh, punching, cutting, forming, um, welding, um, all of these processes, um, they induce specific um, effects on the materials, which later on affect their performance uh, under specific loadings as for instance, the fatigue modeling. So in our case, we wanted to have this approach where we, we followed the performance of the material um, from the sheets uh, until the final components which were being tested. Now, what are the materials that we analyzed in the fatigue for light project? Well, uh, we devoted uh, on uh, some effort on analyzing the behavior of advanced high string steels. And here we've uh, been dealing with uh, CP800 for some application where it is not current state of the art and uh, CP980, 1000 for other uh, applications. Um, then we, we wanted to also 
studied the behavior of stainless steels and also some hybrid solutions, which were, fun, uh, which were built with aluminum alloys and also with um, uh, glass fiber reinforced polymers and carbon fiber reinforced polymers. We've also studied uh, press hardening steels, uh, advanced polymer steels for uh, the hardening, for press hardening of thick sheets. And uh, of course, the behavior of aluminum alloys, which have improved fatigue resistance, reduced cost, and improved environmental profile, of course, thanks to the, the high amount of scrap. Um, OK, now, since you are seeing the, the PDF version of my presentation, um, you'll be missing all of the, I don't know, the, the animations that I have uh, developed for the presentation today, but it's OK. Um, some results at, at material level. Um, in our project during the first year, uh, we had a very extensive uh, experimental campaign where we studied uh, four different types of, of behavior. Of course, the tensile performance of our materials, local form mobility test, fracture toughness, and also environmental effects through uh, some corrosion tests that we performed. And since it's a brief overview that I can, uh, I can share with you today, I just wanted to share some, some results in which you can see comparatively the performance under uh, these four different types of tests. Um, however, for our project, the most important um, result, I would say, that we were interested in finding out was the fatigue performance. So in this sense, uh, we've analyzed the material studied in the project uh, through several different perspectives on, on fatigue with the conventional staircase method, also with some very um, uh, new methods, which are fast fatigue testing methods, the self-heating method, which was a method proposed by ArcelorMittal, and the stiffness method, which was a method proposed by Eurecat. And also we, we analyzed the performance uh, of these materials on the very high cycle fatigue domain, um, an analysis done by Politecnico di Torino, our partner. And uh, here you can see a brief overview uh, where we tried to rank the performance of the different materials uh, by dividing their fatigue strength uh, with, uh, with the mass uh, and for a specific uh, reversion uh, factor, zero one. And what I want to, to spend some time on is on explaining to you one of the fatigue of, uh, past fatigue experimental approaches developed in the project, which is the stiffness method proposed by Eurecat. Um, and this is a very interesting approach because um, here, uh, for instance, um, with only three hourglass specimen, specimens and in about four hours, you can already get an, a, a very good approximation, actually, of the fatigue limit of a specific material. And how is this test performed? Basically, uh, we will be applying or we are applying blocks of 6,000 cycles of loading uh, with increasing uh, levels of amplitude. And after each block, we measure the stiffness of the material. So we unload the, the material and we measure what is the stiffness response. And when we detect a change in this, this stiffness is when uh, we can say that we have located the fatigue limit of the material. Uh, and what's interesting also about this approach is that you can um, find the fatigue limit affected by several different manufacturing processes, for instance, such as trimming and punching, forming and corrosion, etc. And, and you can see here um, a paper uh, published on, on this test if you want to know more information specifically. OK, um, now regarding the results at lab scale demonstrator level, uh, we, we devised uh, a specific geometry which was of interest for us, which had some, uh, some bending and some punched holes um, and uh, some trimming involved. And uh, this industrial demonstrator was tested uh, at Eureka facilities in the laboratory. And we wanted to look at the comparison between um, the, the performance of fully polished configuration with a half polished configuration to understand the influence of the, the um, uh, surface, I would say, finishing uh, on, on the fatigue behavior. From Simna's side, from my institution, we performed a numerical analysis campaign. Uh, and then we saw if with the, the fatigue approach, uh, sim numerical approach simulation that we have, we approximate correctly the behavior observed experimentally. And uh, here you can see that uh, we do. There was a small animation here, but uh, unfortunately you, you will not be able to see it with the crack propagation at, uh, at one, a bit past one million cycles uh, for the CP800 steel. OK, if I go to uh, results at demonstrator level. Now, uh, I have a lot of information on this slide. 
So I'm going to go um, one by one explaining what we can see here. First, we can have overview of two different demonstrators uh, that we developed in the project. Both of them are for uh, a lower control R, okay, uh, on, a, on a Fiat uh, um, uh, car. And uh, we studied the, this demonstrator from several different perspectives. One was to produce it, to manufacture, test, and model uh, with a steel version with the CP980. Okay, so complex phase 1000, let's say. Um, Fiat, the CRF manufactured this, uh, this low control arm and, and tested it. And you can see here in the third image, what is the, the final result after the testing with the failure of the specimen, some buckling that occurred on the inner uh, side of, of the low control arm. And after that, uh, ideally you would have been able to see some, uh, some simulations which were performed by CRF at, uh, at system level and by FIMNE at component level where you can see the failure mode. Uh, this time under, this is uh, the misuse test. So it's just monotonic loading and the fatigue testing is currently um, underway, let's say. Then on the lower part of the slide, we have uh, the same um, demonstrator envision, so the lower control arm, but this time we want to, to model its performance uh, with a hybrid version. So a hybrid version, which means that we have uh, two aluminum sheets, uh, 0.8 thickness on the outer parts of, of the demonstrator. And in the middle, we have a core with glass fiber reinforced polymer, 1.6 millimeter thickness. Uh, and this demonstrator was uh, developed uh, at RICE, manufactured and tested at RICE. And you, uh, ideally, you could have seen here a video of the test. Uh, I had a lot of videos for today, but well, it is what it is. Um, and then from Signal's side, we modeled this, uh, this hybrid version of, of the lower control arm. And we check to see if you obtain the good performance. Still, this is just monotonic testing. Uh, as I said, fatigue testing is next steps, let's say, what is left in the project. Okay, now uh, I would like to show you, um, well, I would have liked to show you <laughs> uh, a nice video where, we see, where you see the stamping of this hybrid uh, lower control arm uh, performed at RISE. Um, in the PDF version, you won't be able to see it, but I put the link over there below. So. Um, if you go to YouTube, you can have a, a really nice experience for about one minute and a half, um, where you can see how we studied uh, uh, this, this hybrid lower control arm. First, from, uh, with a, um, a numerical analysis campaign to decide what was the best geometry and do some topological optimization. And after that, with uh, the actual manufacturing process um, of, uh, of first stamping and well, forming the, the aluminum sheets and then joining together with the glass fiber reinforced core um, and how the final demonstrator was, was actually manufactured. I'm going to go forward. Um, okay, and then we have two different demonstrators that were also analyzed in, in our project. Um, first, the wheel, we, we wanted to analyze the performance of, of um, a wheel, mainly the disc uh, of the wheel, which was a demonstrator proposed by one of our partners, Magneto Wheels. Um, we, they designed a, a new stamping cycle for uh, trying out different materials studied in the project and seeing their performance on this demonstrator. And what was interesting to, to observe here is that, for instance, we, we saw that with the same um, stamping cycle, um, different materials have different performances after this forming cycle. For instance, for some of them, for some materials, uh, the forming process induces beneficially effects towards the fatigue behavior, while for some other materials, uh, the stamping cycle induces detrimental effects. So it's a very um, interesting uh, um, result, I would say. After that, Magneto was performed a quite extensive experimental campaign. They did a lot of work here uh, when they studied uh, the uh, uh, bending test on the discs for different materials with different types of treatment, with shot pinning, without shot pinning. Um, and on the feminine side, we also modeled these solutions to see if we were obtaining a good approximation of the fatigue life with respect to the experimental life, which I can also uh, advance that a little bit. Um, on the other hand, um, we had another demonstrator uh, which we wanted to study in the project, which was a cross member beam, which was proposed by, uh, by our uh, Swedish uh, partner, Gestamp Hartek. Uh, and they chose a symmetrical design uh, here. I also had a nice animation where you could see the actual manufacturing process um, with the hot stamping of, of this uh, cross member beam. Uh, but either way, you can see the final result after the manufacturing. So they manufactured half a beam. 
Uh, and you can see the test setup where uh, the beam was screwed to, to, um, to a plate. And then uh, the cyclic loading, or first the monotonic loading, but afterwards cyclic loading, was applied to the end of the beam in several directions to study the performance of, uh, of this demonstrator, which was manufactured uh, with, the, um, with the press hardened steel with 22 manganese bottom five. Uh, from Simna's side, we also wanted to study the performance uh, numerically. And uh, at the moment, at least for the monotonic case, we are obtaining uh, quite interesting, um, good approximation to what was seen in the test. Okay. Now, um, let me go forward. What about the echo design assessment? Because what I've shown today uh, is a lot of work that we've done in the project, but focused mainly on mechanical testing, right? So what was the mechanical performance of these different solutions? Um, well, um, that's interesting, but that's not the only considerant that we want to have into, into mind when we rank performance for different materials for different uh, components. And uh, we, we did a lot of work on the echo design assessment. Now, today, the time that I have is limited, so I won't be able to share with you these results. So that's why to be continued. But uh, I would really, really like to invite you to follow us if you are interested in these results that I've shown to you today uh, on, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on our YouTube channel, and also visit our website. And most importantly, we will be organizing quite a lot of webinars towards the end of the project where we want to share with, uh, with the community our results and our findings. So um, if you're interested in this eco-design assessment, Please join our webinars. We are waiting for you. And from my side, nothing, nothing else. Uh, thank you very much for for listening to me. And um, I, I terribly apologize for for this um, ah this trouble with with the animations in the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Luigi. It's a very very interesting presentation. Uh, apart from the technical problems, but it was just a shame that we couldn't see the manufacturing, uh, the video in the manufacturing uh, demonstration. But anyway, it's available for the link is available and people can see it in YouTube. Um, so let's see whether we have some uh, questions for, for you from the audience. Let me see. Yes, I think that we have a question from Christian. Uh, can you explain how you produced or select more scrap, scrap based aluminum alloys for your testing? And have you, uh, did you observe different results in this case? Well, um, first, how did we choose or, or how did we decide which aluminum alloys we are going to, to analyze in the project? Well, we based our expertise or, or we, best, we based our choice on the expertise of our uh, aluminum supplier, Profil Glass. Um, and basically, we, we let them advise us what they thought was the best solution uh, to study in the project based on the high scrap content. So we studied two different aluminum alloys, the 6082 and the 6181. Um, and to be honest, we, we went with their expertise. Profil Glass uh, advised us that we, we, we should study uh, the performance of these alloys. And have you seen the, the, the results regarding when you, depending on the alloy? Well, there there are there is some variation between uh, both alloys, um, but I would say not significant uh, in in between these two at least that we studied. Um, we decided to go with the 6181 uh, for the hybrid demonstrator because it had a slightly better uh, performance in terms of fatigue. So uh, obviously, fatigue was was a big uh, I don't know interest in in our project. So that's why we we, we chose this for the hybrid demonstrator. Okay, good. Uh, I have a question on my own because we you just mentioned about eco design, which is a part an integral part of the project as well. It's not just ranking the solutions that you have uh, regarding the mechanical performance, but also into the you know the the the, the, the um, I would say how this would um, help, for example, lightweighting and other. I suppose that's what you mean by eco design. So at yeah. this point in the in the project. Uh, could you tell us what would be the the the, the ranking? Which solution uh, could uh, ranked in better ranked in terms of weight saving? This aspect, the eco design, the performance itself, because then it's a balance of different yeah. aspects. So can you, yes. at this point, you can say which one? I, I can comment. I can comment a little bit. Um, the final assessment, I would say, is is work that we are planning to do in the last uh, this last step of, of the project. 
Um, but as you say, it is a bit of a mixed bag because, um, of course, depending on, on which criteria you, you give priority to, right? If it's mechanical performance, if it's recyclability, if it's uh, uh, weight uh, saving, um, then you get different results. Um, and this is quite an interesting assessment. So I, I really, really want to, to invite you to our webinars where we'll be giving a lot of details on this. Um, but I would like to comment here uh, something that specifically um, puts into a good light, I would say, um, this hybrid component uh, that involved aluminum. Um, and I would say that the, the maximum weight reduction that we observed in our project was on this um, demonstrator with this hybrid uh, composition. And we managed to reduce the weight of the component at about 40%. Uh, now, as I say, it's a mixed bag because uh, we need to analyze also what is the mechanical behavior with respect to, to the other demonstrators, but also what's the recyclability um, uh, capacity, I would say, because we have some glass fiber reinforced polymer in there, not just aluminum. So, well, it, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but let's just say that this hybrid solution, this hybrid component um, enabled us to reduce 43% of the weight, which is not bad at all. No, indeed not. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Lucia. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much, me. Carla. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'd like to present our ne next speaker. So it's my pleasure to present, present Alvise Bianchi from MBA in Nanomaterialia. So he will be representing the Flamingo project. Um, where, so he, the title of his presentation is Flamingo Circularity Feasibility Effects of Nanoparticle Inclusion in Aluminium Alloys. So a few words about Alvizi's background. So he, um, for more than 14 years, Alvizi has been actively involved in national and European projects. So mainly focusing on developing materials in the energy sector. So his work has revolved around creating new methods for making unstructured and advanced alloy, alloys in powder form, including their classification and handling. And throughout his career, he's gained experience in powder consolidation and deposition processes. Uh, Ovizi has gained his master's degree in material science in the University of Padua, and he currently works uh, at MBN. So Ovizi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for kind introduction. So uh, today I'm here uh, to talk about Flamingo, uh, and his focus is on aluminum metal matrix composites. And uh, last time I presented uh, uh, Flamingo, I, I realized that I should uh, do some strong changes on uh, my presentations. So I decided today to, to start from the bottom. So next, it's we start from the questions. And uh, uh, well, the questions, uh, <laughs> I will uh, put them for myself. And the first one uh, on next slide is uh, uh, um, on the next slide. Yep, is why flamingo. Uh, in flamingo, we want to um, exploit a different sampling mechanism that uh, uh, my company MBN has utilized in also many other different alloys, which is the inclusion of uh, nanoparticles in the alloy itself. So this is not a completely new uh, mechanism for aluminum alloys, uh, but uh, what is new is uh, um, the way in uh, which in, in Flamingo we are um, trying to assess it and to evaluate it. And especially uh, the, um, uh, the things that we want to do is to try to be less dependent on our composition by gaining uh, some uh, strengthening from dispersion of nanoparticles and to compete uh, with steel or more car components and see how far we can uh, uh, try to uh, uh, go with uh, light weightening in, uh, in, in vehicles, especially electrical vehicles. So uh, next slide, uh, how we can achieve this. So the main problems that we wanted to address uh, uh, are related with the nanoparticles itself, of course. So we knew the nanoparticles should be easy to disperse, 
they should have similar density with uh, the aluminum matrix. They should have a good wettability, a good stability on uh, molten aluminum, so not, not to be reactive uh, and dissolve in it. Nanoparticles should be safe. So, and this is through throughout uh, the entire uh, value chain, the manufacturing of the components. And the addition of nanoparticles should also be affordable. Otherwise, it is not much uh, of a sense to, to put it on the market. Then, of course, and this uh, is of paramount importance, uh, is that the new aluminum uh, metamatics nanocomposite should be recyclable uh, without uh, uh, messing up with the current uh, methodologies that are already in place and are quite effective for, uh, for aluminum recycling. So we tackle these uh, many points uh, uh, with uh, two, two main approaches. Uh, these are, let's say, some uh, um, decision by design of, about the development of these materials. Uh, the, the, the first uh, part has been addressed by the use of uh, pre-dispersed uh, and concentrated additives of nanoparticles. So this gave us the possibility to uh, already provide to the um, industries who do the casting uh, um, a way to uh, put in the nanoparticles in a safe and already uh, pre-worked way, let's say. And the other part is to focus on expandable uh, nanoparticles. So something that we do not uh, strictly need to recover after the uh, recycling, but we can afford to uh, lose uh, in the final recycling step. So, next. Uh, we had to set up all this uh, um, flow of activities in Flamingo in order to check uh, the evolution of materials in all the manufacturing steps. So we started the uh, first manufacturing step is the uh, production of the additives, the nanoparticles uh, master batches in aluminum. These have a concentration between uh, 20 to 40 percent in nanoparticles uh, in just aluminum or uh, aluminum uh, uh, with some addition of other elements to make it more compatible with uh, the alloy eventually. Then uh, all of this goes to foundries in order to have uh, um, cast and melt to be utilized for DC casting and followed by extrusion, prints and casting, low pressure like casting, high pressure like casting. And uh, uh, of course since we had to check the um, the light saving, uh, weight saving of this um, solution, we took the opportunity to introduce also topology optimization in order to get the most out of uh, these uh, new components uh, made especially by uh, those by greens and casting. Uh, all these uh, uh, will, will be tested in field and uh, uh, a recycling step is also one of the important the most important one, I said, to evaluate if this solution can be actually put on the market uh, without creating more problems than those that they are supposed to solve. The safety about the use of nanoparticles is controlled in all the points of this value chain. So it is controlled during the production master batches, during the uh, melting, uh, and introduction of these uh, additives. It is controlled uh, uh, after uh, the casting and in particular during the um, cutting and the machining of uh, the components and the bi-components. And of course, it's controlled during the recycling. LCA and CCA uh, is done in order to be able to compare our solution uh, eventually with, uh, with the other ones. To do this, uh, we needed 
uh, the Flamingo project. Uh, next, for which uh, we uh, put together partners from all over Europe, uh, experts in the different fields that I've mentioned, and uh, the project has a duration of uh, 48 months. Uh, since uh, we are, uh, we intend to uh, test uh, extensively the components on uh, the vehicle itself, which is not a supercar, uh, but is uh, another sector of uh, vehicles uh, which is uh, really growing in terms of uh, electric vehicles, which is the small. Um, segment of uh, vehicle, uh, the, the utility vehicle or vehicles in general that can be used in the cities for the small community. In particular, IK is the company uh, supporting us with uh, providing us with a vehicle in which we are uh, considering uh, different components and to be substituted there and which will provide us a good platform for, for testing. Next. So these are the technologies involved in Flamingo. The metal alloying with the solid state um, milling. Uh, this is the technique that we are using to uh, uh, homogenize the additive, the nanoparticles in the uh, metal matrix. And uh, um, yeah, uh, the low pressure die casting, green casting, uh, at this uh, group, we also added uh, high pressure casting. Uh, topology optimization uh, to identify uh, effective uh, design solutions uh, for the components. Extrusion uh, of components, which is one of the main uh, processes for aluminum. And of course, welding, because uh, having the nanoparticles requires us also to, to check the weldability of these components, how well they can be uh, processed in uh, currently uh, standard um, production environments. Uh, the uh, non-destructive techniques uh, will be used uh, in uh, for, for testing uh, components in uh, real uh, uh, environments, and of course the, the recycling. All these uh, technologies uh, uh, has to be supported also with uh, uh, another group of activities that uh, that should ensure or uh, let's say facilitate uh, eventually the uh, transferring of all these results into the uh, industry so into the markets. So we already are starting doing training uh, between ourselves and starting to prepare. Um, guidelines for the uh, use of these uh, um, new approaches for the production of alloys. And uh, we are start considering the standardization uh, um, standards and the modification required to the standards to uh, make uh, these uh, additives and the use of nanoparticles in alloys uh, uh, accepted by the industrial community. And uh, this here is missing, but of course, the nano safety aspect is uh, quite important to have all convinced that uh, the use of nanoparticles uh, in this environment is, uh, is safe in the way we are doing it. So, next, so I want to uh, give you some comments on the objectives of Flamingo. Uh, the first one of the objective is the production of the uh, additive via solid state mechanical alloy. So this approach gives us the possibility to work uh, on, on a, a small scale, uh, which can be of course uh, increased uh, for the handling of nanoparticles in the quite controlled environment and uh, uh, to um, Mix them uh, with uh, aluminum in powder form, which can can be uh, from primary sources or secondary sources, and get a very concentrated uh, uh, additives, a very concentrated master batch that can be diluted uh, uh, afterwards. Moreover, the solid state approach uh, gives us the opportunity to create nanoparticles in situ via uh, mechanochemical reaction. And this is particularly true with uh, uh, titanium carbide formation in, in 
to buy it. And this has a lot of benefits because it implies no handling of nanoparticles, no production of free nanoparticles. Uh, but that it has some drawbacks that has to be uh, set carefully, like the quite uh, broad particle size, nanoparticle size distributions, which means uh, uh, different um, uh, behaviors uh, eventually in, uh, uh, in the process of casting and in the performance of the components. Uh, yeah, then uh, there is the inoculation of the no, no, say uh, yes. <laughs> the nucleation of the additives in the aluminum melt and the homogenization, uh, homogenization, and stirring is a huge part of the technical development that we are having uh, in the Flamingo. This is the uh, main, uh, uh, it's the main technological barrier to have a complete. Uh, uh, and well distributed alloy. So it's one thing is to do it uh, at small scale, uh, completely different things is to do it at big scale. We have already good results at uh, a small and medium scale. Uh, the upscale solutions uh, can benefit from these results, but require still some uh, adapta technical adaptations. And this is uh, one of the, let's say, core results for the industry, I think, uh, from Flamingo. The production of smaller components uh, is, uh, yeah, it's already ongoing. We selected uh, uh, interesting components for the card, you will see later. And uh, the components are also chosen uh, in order to produce by extrusion. Next. Uh, weldability assessment uh, uh, is, uh, as I said, uh, a, an interesting uh, validation point uh, for the project. Uh, since uh, we want to uh, check the weldability of our materials toward the existing materials, and of course the weldability of uh, our materials within themselves. And I skip directly to the validation of recycling, uh, which uh, is done uh, at um, uh, industrial scale. We want to uh, put together uh, our uh, materials along with uh, similar ones, so um, scrap materials in the same group following uh, the uh, current uh, standards and procedures for aluminum recycling. So the aim is to uh, create a scenario in which uh, uh, these aluminum mathematics nanocomposites are already in the industries and uh, to check uh, what uh, the current techniques uh, uh, categorize them. So the nanoparticle contents uh, in the final uh, components is generally around 1%, 1% and uh, it's really uh, difficult to detect it uh, in, uh, uh, with the, the current uh, standards that are applied. So uh, once, uh, for example, uh, a uh, aluminum uh, of uh, the 6,000 is added with nanoparticles, uh, it is recycled uh, along with all the other aluminum of the same series. And uh, we wanted to know uh, what is the fate of the nanoparticles. And after the, the, the first round of tests, we already see that uh, nanoparticles are removed and uh, the, no more present in uh, the billet after the recycling, which is a good uh, outcome of, uh, of the process. But of course, we are following up testing it with all the scraps that we are producing uh, in, uh, in our uh, testing of components. On next slide, just a look of to, to, to the vehicle, the ATX produced by Ike, in which we are working for the substitution of the steering knuckle and the rear frame. These are two components that are quite representative of uh, uh, parts that can be obtained by casting and extrusion. And uh, the information gathered on these 
components will allow us to do an extrapolation exercise and uh, try to consider uh, what would be the weight of uh, a vehicle entirely done or done with uh, all the aluminum possible. And uh, what we want to, to check is uh, if the aluminum solution uh, that we provide are uh, strong enough uh, to allow substitution of steel. So we have a target of uh, three euros per kilogram on the vehicle saved, which is a target uh, more for high-end uh, cars or standard uh, uh, cars rather than the small vehicles. But is uh, in any case uh, uh, good, uh, good to have uh, good to have in mind. Next, you can see. Uh, oh yes, this is uh, I forgot that. And uh, there is a uh, now on the previous one. Yes, there is a, a percentage on uh, about uh, the weight saving we already reached on these components on the steel knuckle and the rear frame. Uh, these, of course, are comparison between uh, the uh, current components in the, so the current steel knuckle made on steel and the rear frame made of steel, uh, which are anchoring. So we are speaking between uh, 30 to uh, 50 weight percent saving in these components. And in this next slide, yes, there is a, a a view of what we achieved in terms of uh, also topology optimization for these components. Uh, these have followed uh, all the uh, phases, and uh, uh, this is the steering knuckle. You can see on the left uh, the current design for the steel component, and on the right uh, a topology optimized uh, uh, design. The uh, Let's say the, the problem with the policy optimization is that uh, it is um, uh, quite effective for uh, to obtain uh, geometries uh, that are lightweight, but uh, they can be obtained uh, just by green sand casting or additive manufacturing, which poses some problems uh, from the point of view of uh, the realization of these components. So eventually, we end up in a, we end up in a um, design solution, which is yes, topology optimized, but not extremely topology optimized because it has to be realized by uh, low pressure by casting. So some uh, overhangs uh, has to be removed, uh, some other uh, details uh, has to be adjusted in order to be compatible with uh, mold manufacturing. Next. These are some um, some some uh, preliminary results we already got uh, from the introduction of nanoparticles into aluminum alloys. We are working with the series 300 and the series 6000 for the uh, the casting and the extrusion respectively. Uh, the um, nanoparticles that we are um, testing primarily are tit titanium carbide and silicon carbide. Titanium carbide is produced by uh, reactive mechanical alloying, so it has a wide particle size distribution, whereas uh, silicon carbide is more homogeneous and uh, generally uh, in, the nano, in the nano range. We also tested uh, the aluminum oxide, which in principle uh, could have been uh, a very nice solution from the point of view of the recycling because it is. Uh, already quite well understood how to remove that, uh, but, but the mechanical properties eventually were not good enough to make out of the initial selection uh, during the project. So this um, uh, strengthening mechanism that we have seen on these series uh, can be different on other series. We have noticed in some cases that uh, uh, some uh, mm, already uh, strengthened alloys uh, can somehow mask the um, effect of the nanoparticle additions. Uh, so um, I think we will not have the opportunity in the project to test more uh, uh, aluminum alloys, uh, or at least um, try to start a search about uh, 
which is the uh, alloy solution that most can benefit from nanoparticle addition, but it could be a very, very, very nice uh, uh, follow-up of the project. Next. So, as I said, to maximize the results, we are working also on uh, um, other, uh, other less technical uh, aspects. So the assessment of methodologies, the recycling and the standards, and the uh, creation of guidelines. Uh, but on this part, I can move more quickly, so we can go to the next part and uh, have a look about the uh, outcomes that we are expecting from uh, the project, the impact on the next slide. Good. So what we want to achieve are these, uh, we expect to achieve are these effect on the vehicle. So more of road capabilities, more function due to the uh, decrease of weight uh, on the components that we have selected. And this could give also more flexibility in the vehicle configuration and uh, more, more in, I mean, an increase in the uh, in value of the but in the medium term and in, in, in long term, we can think more of a, a redesign of the of the vehicle, which can benefit from the decrease of weight in some of the structural components, and the decrease of weight implies a battery redesign. The battery is the main uh, contributor of the weight in this vehicle. So uh, it, uh, it, it triggers uh, uh, design also of the, of the engine, uh, electrical engine. And uh, this um, loop of uh, uh, weight saving uh, that uh, basically uh, contribu contributes one to the other uh, provides, uh, will, will arrive or to a uh, uh, plateau of uh, optimization of the vehicle, uh, which uh, which we hope can be transferred also to uh, more standard uh, lines of vehicles. But this is only the tip of the iceberg that you have uh, <laughs> that you have seen appearing. Uh, next, So we hope that in, in, uh, Flamingo can have impact on the use of nanoparticles more in general, not only on the vehicle, but also in general, also in other sectors, uh, have an impact on the established uh, uh, establishment of guidelines for recycling that uh, also can consider uh, practices for removing nanoparticles. Uh, the possibility to provide it to the automotive industry with a wider portfolio of uh, sustainable materials, because of course, if you can increase the strength of an alloy by including nanoparticles, you maybe can decrease the use of other uh, critical raw material in the alloy uh, composition. And support of standard for uh, the inclusion of uh, aluminum uh, metal matrix nanocomposites, which at the moment are in the market, but uh, not so uh, well captured by standards. Yep. Basically, we arrived at the end, so back to the question, but this time uh, for, for your side. Okay, thank you very much, Alvizi, for this very nice overview of the um, Flamingo project. Uh, we're running a little bit over time, but I think that we still have time for a couple of questions. And there's uh, namely, there's a question from the audience. Michael just, I think he's uh, touching a quite interesting subject because it's one of the uh, main technological barriers in this project related to the casting. So his question is about the integration of the nanoparticles in the melt. And uh, there's a lot of details about the melt equipment, et cetera, and how to get the homogenized uh, melt. And of course, there's a concern how this is going to be tackled in a project in terms of first the 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 techn technological side itself of uh, producing the material with the integration nanoparticles, and also 
how this can be, um, this affect, for example, aspects like wear of the equipment and which equipment will, um, you know, can we use for machining the parts economically? And there's also an extension to the question about the fact that we are concentrating this project in terms of uh, as a measure of performance is the uh, mechanical properties that we can achieve. But there's a question also on his side regarding the fatigue life. So could you comment on those uh, points, please? Yeah, so I can start commenting from the wear on the components. So we were expecting a, a severe wear on the extrusion dies, effectively, uh, but uh, from what we have seen so far, this is not one of the main problems, is the amount of nanoparticles that are uh, effectively improving the mechanical properties is below 1%. So uh, this is not an amount that uh, trigger a severe or a particular uh, problem on the extrusion uh, uh, dies and also on the um, components used for the casting or the melting of the of the system. And yeah, we we provide uh, this uh, uh, in uh, the additive in powder form. It's a powder which is uh, which has particles around hundreds of micron, and uh, we are also checking which is the difference uh, uh, in providing it in a powder form or in the form of uh, uh, lumps. But the the problem in any case is uh, the, the string uh, and have it uh, uh, well dispersed before starting. Uh, uh, the actual casting into molds or or the direct chip casting. Uh, thing, uh, yeah, as regarding fatigue, as regarding fatigue, uh, uh, this is something that we are uh, still working on. Uh, the evaluation we have done are more on uh, uh, tensile properties, uh, not yet fatigue. But uh, yeah, I'd like to, to, to let's say, uh, place with uh, fatigue for LIDAR to have a, a possible cross project check of materials. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a very good, I think, um, cross pollinization initiative if we can um, leverage on the findings in the fatigue for light project. That would be in to, to assist the evaluation of our materials within Flamingo project. Um, uh, obviously, there's just one question about the cost uh, in terms of cost per, uh, perspective, because you mentioned target of three uh, euros per kilo. Yeah. And uh, as a target for for the application, we 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 have uh, in mind as a demonstrator. But the question is how uh, how this can be competitive? You know, this kind of material with all the you know some some complexities in terms of its manufacturing route. And how can the can this material be competitive over conventional metals such as the you know the the, the very steel that we are trying to um, substitute? Yeah, that that uh, cost is. Uh, uh... It's not a figure that we uh, came up with. It's something that we realized from uh, by analyzing uh, the automotive industry is there are different reports about that. So that is the uh, um, the willing of paying extra for uh, car manufacturers uh, to to get a decrease in weight of the components. And uh, if we can stay within that cost, uh, then uh, it is something that for car manufacturers is uh, worth to be included in uh, production of the vehicle. Okay. Okay, Ovis, I would like to thank you again for your presentation and for addressing those questions. And I would like to um, move on for the next session. So we have uh, the last um, the, the last talk of the day of the session. So it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. So we have Sergi Parareda Oriol and Andoni Agiri Menchaka from Gestampe, and they will be representing the Flex Crash project. 
Uh, their presentation title is Flex Crash, New Generation of Crash Tolerant Structures. So I'd like to say a few words about our presenter. So Sergi is a PhD, PhD candidate in Material Science, and he has, uh, he, he has a research career at ERICAT since 2015, including a short stay at the Scania Research Center. So his main area of expertise covers the intricate fields of fatigue and fracture behavior of metallic alloys. And Andoni, Andoni's professional career started in 2015 as a CAE engineer at the Stamp R&D uh, in Paris, uh, developing projects for the main French car manufacturers. And since to, uh, to 2022, he has been involved in OEM and other R&D projects worldwide as a pro, uh, product engineer based in Spain. So within this position, Andoni contributes to the design of components based on Gestamp's technologies and highly engineered project, uh, products focused on weight, CO2 footprint, cost, and safety parameters. And his academic background includes a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the Faculty Engineer of Bilbao and a master's degree in aerospace propulsion from Cranfield University. So my pleasure to, to give the floor to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, for, for the introduction. Um, I hope you can see the my screen, the presentation in full, full screen. Perfect. Um, yes, well, as mentioned, uh, today we will present together with Andoni uh, the Flex Crash project. Um, here you can see an, an, over, let's see, an overview of this presentation. So the aim is to cover a lot of different points, but mainly uh, just the introduction of the Flex Crash project, the needs that the project uh, try, will try to solve, the, the research beyond the state of the art, the, some fresh results that we have since it's a, let's say, a, a quite new project, um, and then some uh, work uh, that we already done in the, in the different work, uh, work packages. So um, the Flex Crash uh, project, uh, just to have an overview, is a Norizon project uh, that have a, a duration of four years and started last year in 2022 with a budget of 4 million euros. And we are 10 partners from uh, five different European countries and we are coordinating uh, this project from Eureka. So the main, and here you can see in the in the slide, the, what the, the main name of this project is to uh, develop these crash structures by using green aluminum and also by developing this new uh, hybrid manufacturing processes. So regarding the consortium, uh, we are 10 partners, as I mentioned, it, um, from five European countries, from Spain, Sweden, Italy, Austria, and Germany. Uh, three research centers, uh, which are Eurecat, Fraunhofer, our virtual vehicle, two universities, Lulio, IMC, uh, three industrial partners, GMAT, Gestam, and Aerobase, and one industrial research center uh, that belongs to Stellantis group, and uh, then the standardization body uh, from UNE. So regarding flex, flex crash, the main, as I mentioned it very briefly, the main aim of, uh, or the main idea of a flex crash project is to help the, the automotive sector, which is, let's say, so uh, sometimes uh, uh, quite traditional when dealing with this uh, manufacturing of uh, uh still uh, metallic parts let's say and the main aim is to uh, develop a new flexible and hybrid uh, technologies that will help uh, to obtain a crash tolerant uh, structures and mainly made of green uh, aluminum alloys and to obtain these um, crash tolerant structures the project uh, um, is focused on developing uh, new surface patterns uh, on some points of the vehicle, some strategic points of the vehicles, of the vehicle that will help uh, to reduce the, the the weight of the vehicle of the new components, but also to increase the the safety of the vehicle, and of course uh, reduce the the risk and fatalities in crashes. So, um, with these different points, the main um, or, or the the flex crash project will contribute to the to the European automotive by auto, automotive industry by um, uh, obtaining a more sustainable and lighter vehicle structures. So as I mentioned, by using this uh, green aluminum alloys and um, these new techniques, we will be capable of uh, obtaining this um, uh, 
new lighter uh, structures that will perform uh, much better in uh, crash situations. Um, this point will help to uh, to achieve the European uh, Union emission targets. So reduce, uh, by reducing the in 40 percent the greenhouse gases by 2030, and which is also aligned with the European policies for a cleaner and more uh, competitive Europe. So the main aim, yeah, as you can see here in the right hand side, uh, right hand side of the of the slide, is the uh, to obtain uh, low weight uh, components that can uh, perform better in terms of uh, crash, but also that can help to reduce the the CO2 emissions while the greenhouse uh, gases uh, of the the uh, the vehicles. So in order to achieve these uh, these two points, basically we are facing uh, two different um, let's say to this yeah two different points. Uh, which one, uh, one is the vehicle light weighting. So the main aim is try to reduce the as I mentioned the weight of the vehicle, and the other one is uh, to increase the passenger safety. And this is the these are the, the the main points of the of the project. So the project is mainly focused on on working on the in this area, and the expected results after working on developing these different points uh, will be were expected to be uh, the crash simulation from advanced material to virtual testing. So cover all the chain, let's say from uh, the very beginning, uh, identifying which are the uh, the most critical situations in 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 crash uh, in crash scenarios, and then uh, working on the different materials and different um, solutions that we can uh, bring to uh, deal with these uh, situations. Then um, work and uh, obtain uh, these flexible and every manufacturing technologies uh, to uh, bring to the automotive industry another uh, tool to address the new requirements that can. Uh, uh, that can appear in the in the, in the future. Uh, uh, obtain these new crash tolerant structures with uh, lighter uh, vehicles as well, and then also work with uh, uh, advanced testing. Um, so the main idea is to develop a, a new test to obtain or to characterize the materials that we are using in terms of crash, toughness, fatigue, uh, a lot of different mechanical properties in a fast way. So in this way, we can um, just uh, increase the, the the or reduce the time uh, required to impl uh, implement all of this uh, knowledge that we are developing here in this in this project. And finally, well, uh, sort of related with the first point, just identify the current needs uh, in terms of uh, safety, but uh, also the future needs uh, that will appear when we are we, when we we will have these autonomous vehicles and also the conventional vehicles, let's say, and what will happen in these in these scenarios. So here we have just very schematic the project phases. So we have a first phase uh, identifying this crash situation, gathering a lot of information of uh, the, which is the current situation and the future situation of the the, the crash scenarios, and then uh, improving. The crash simulation, uh, in order to predict which will be will be the the injuries of the passengers or the the most probable situations in case of crash, and then in the phase two develop uh, new materials and new solutions uh, in order to uh, give an answer to these different uh, situations identified in uh, in the first phase. And finally, uh, virtual and uh, experimental validation of all of these different situations, uh, sorry, solutions, uh, just to validate that we are uh, solving uh, this uh, in the in the proper way the, um, the points that we identified in the first uh, stages. Um, okay, and now here I will just to sh share with you a, a short video about flash crash to have an overview of flash crash. Um, I hope that you can listen it properly. If not, we will share with you the uh, the link of the, the, the video and you can then uh, Road crashes are a serious concern for everyone who gets behind the wheel. And while the European Union aims for a 50% reduction by 2030, progress towards this goal has been slow. The Flex Crash European project takes on this challenge to transform the automotive sector. 
Flex Crash is dedicated to developing flexible and hybrid manufacturing technology that produces crash tolerant vehicle structures. At Flex Crash, our focus is on designing safer vehicle structures by locally reinforcing critical areas in a crash event. This approach increases passenger safety and reduces fatalities across a wide range of crash conditions. By seamlessly integrating high strength green aluminum alloys into its car structures, Flex Crash achieves both lightweight and sustainable chassis, maintaining their impact resistance and minimizing their environmental footprint. To ensure that Flex Crash structures meet the safety needs of current and future mobility, they will undergo rigorous testing, which includes advanced material models, different crash scenarios, and virtual testing. An initiative supporting the EU long-term goals on zero emissions mobility, reduction in injuries and fatalities due to crashes, towards safer and lighter crash structures. The Flex Crash project has received funding from the Horizon Europe program under. Okay, so now I just uh, leave the, the the floor to my colleague Andoni. Okay, thank you, Sergi, for this uh, complete uh, introduction. So now I will try to give an overview of the work that has been done in this uh, first year no, of the of the project. But before uh, explaining the concept that we have started uh, to work on, I would like to shortly uh, talk about the future relevant uh, crash scenarios because this is only a, a key point no, of this uh, project. So in this sense, uh, what we can already see in, in the roads is that the traffic is more and more uh, heterogeneous. No? We can see at the same time in the same road uh, traditional combustion cars with uh, full electric vehicles. Uh, we can also see bigger and bigger SUVs with uh, small city cars. And what we know is that this uh, trend will continue uh, to increase in the future as uh, automated vehicles uh, massively start to, to share the, the roads with the human uh, drivers. Uh, so this is, uh, in fact, one of the objectives no, of, the, of the project, uh, try to identify how this uh, mixed uh, traffic environment in the future uh, can affect the, the crash uh, events uh, compared to the current uh, situation. Uh, in this sense, uh, we can expel no, less human errors, so, so we have some, some, some ideas, but uh, the information and real crash data uh, available uh, related to automated automated vehicles uh, so far is mm, quite uh, limited uh, with a few experiences uh, worldwide. So uh, this is why uh, in this project, our project partner, IMC uh, University of uh, Krems, uh, has developed a, a tool that uh, reconstructs uh, crash scenarios based on genetic algorithms and that uh, allows us to uh, simulate how an automated vehicle would react e in a real crash uh, situation. So for this purpose, uh, this tool uh, takes as a input uh, existing real crash uh, reports, and based on this, it generates and it uh, optimizes uh, a crash uh, a scenario, no? a simulation. So once the simulation is set up, uh, we can place the, the autonomous driving system into the simulation and see how it uh, reacts uh, uh, and which is the, the consequence no, of this collision. So that we can get as, a, as an output uh, all the relevant collision metrics, such as the, the impact angle, the velocity, the location of the collision and so on. So if we move to the following slide, uh, if we cross, uh, what we have done is we have cross-checked the, yeah, we have cross-checked the, the output of uh, of this tool with the, the benchmark, and we have uh, identified three uh, main scenarios, cross scenarios for this project. So the first one on the left is the straight uh, crossing path. Uh, where we can see no, the blue car going straight uh, that it's, uh, and it's impacted from the left uh, side. The second one, which is a left uh, turn across a uh, path, in this case in lateral direction, because the blue car is uh, turning left. And this, the third uh, scenario that we have uh, identified is the, also the similar to the, the previous one, but in this case it's in opposite direction because the, the green car is coming from the front. So if we move on uh, one slide more, uh, 
uh, we have uh, already identified the, the crash scenarios that we will uh, use, but now the goal is to design no, a structure that can absorb enough uh, energy in a frontal crash so that we can uh, avoid any kind of injuries on the occupants. So this uh, statement is quite uh, clear and quite uh, simple, but all the implications behind are quite complex because we need to take into account uh, legal requirements and the protection not only of occupants, but also of pedestrian, many variables in terms of speed, in terms of impact angle, overlap, uh, proportion of uh, overlap no, between different uh, cars, the compatibility, and of course, uh, economic factors that we always need to keep in mind and sustainability and ecological factors that are uh, fundamental in this project. So in order to achieve this goal, uh, we have uh, combined or we're going to combine three, three pillars. No? On the one hand, we will have a passive structure that will uh, consist of uh, aluminum uh, parts uh, manufactured by traditional technologies, let's say, uh, for example, extrusion or, or die casting. But on top of, the, on top of these uh, parts, we will add some uh, added value uh, functional features by additive manufacturing in order to uh, have a more robust design no? in, in terms of uh, crash angle, speed and so on, and eventually uh, reduce the weight of, of the structure. And on the other hand, the aim is to, to in, integrate also an, an active system that will somehow uh, allow the structure to adapt uh, for its uh, crash scenario, having a, a, a complete robust uh, system. So if we have a look more in detail in the next slide, we can see uh, here on the, on the left side, we have started with the die casting part uh, that we see here, that it's coming from the Salema project and that we uh, all know quite well now after the, the nice presentation of uh, Manel. We have, based on this uh, part, uh, drawn some initial simple extruded uh, profiles, uh, some longitudinal members, and a cross member, a bumper, as we can see here. And the aim now is to uh, combine this passive structure with an active system so that uh, we will have not only uh, actuators, but it will also need to integrate some sensors no, in order to uh, detect the, the parameters of the collision and also uh, some auxiliary elements and control unit and so on. So uh, in the following slide, uh, yeah, so uh, as we can see here, all the outputs of this, uh, of this uh, project in terms of designs or material modeling or all, all of the outputs uh, will be validated uh, and tested in full crash uh, simulation. So for this uh, purpose, we will use the GLAB G3 uh, model that has been internally developed uh, by Gestamp that we can see here. And we will simulate three, uh, three crash scenarios that are based on the three cases previously identified and mentioned. No? So we will have a first one with a relative uh, angle of 89 degrees between the barrier and the vehicle. Uh, another one with a relative uh, angle of 146 de degrees and a final one with a relative angle of 110 degrees. So this was all from my side. I give you back the, the, the floor, Sergi. Thank you. Thank you, Andoni, for the nice presentation. And I would like just to uh, complement or add some more information about this uh, ABFF that uh, Andoni mentioned. It. And this is the current work that we already done in the this first work packages or these first stages of, of the of the project. And um, yeah, as you can see here, well, uh, we are we are working on developing these uh, new aluminum powders with high amount of recycled aluminum and also with a low content of uh, critical raw materials. Here, once again, we are using part of the knowledge uh, developed in uh, Salema project. And right now, we have just two materials on the table and also with some added uh, zirconium uh, in order to enhance somehow the mechanical properties for the 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 laser metal deposition method that we will you, you will see later and um, here you can see uh, just a picture on uh, how we are producing these aluminum powder particles and we are using a centrifugal optimization this uh, let's say uh, quite simple uh, to see how it works but then it's not that simple uh, to produce this uh, this powder 
So the process is just mainly based on uh, to melt the material and then uh, drop this melted material uh, uh, on a spinning disc that spreads this uh, aluminum alloy in, uh, in, inside the tank. And we are producing these small particles of about 50 to 100 microns that are then used here in the laser metal deposition um, machine. Uh, here, I think there is another video uh, and you can see, well, the, this is the, the tool or the, the process that we propose in the, in the project in order to uh, print and to add these uh, small scale 3D structures onto different components uh, of the vehicle. And here right now, what we are doing is just uh, developing uh, or see, uh, trying to see which are the the best conditions, the best uh, the parameters uh, to obtain uh, this AVFF. So in order to obtain the best shape or the lower thermal uh, effect in the um, in the base material and the best conditions to obtain these uh, uh, properties or well, this uh, ABFF with different shapes and so on. And then once we will have this, uh, these conditions, the, the idea is to, as mentioned, it, uh, to uh, improve the, the mechanical behavior of this these profiles here, for instance, here we just uh, added some pictures from this uh, front part. So here we have this front rail of this part, we, and we have the, the, the front rail without um, the, the, the ABFF, and then we have different um, kind of ABFF, in this case, uh, straight lines with different lengths. But the main idea is try to also uh, use different uh, patterns that some you can see some examples here in the right hand side of the, the slide uh, in order to obtain this behavior that we want uh, to increase the absorbed crash energy but also uh, to reduce the, the the weight of the of the vehicle and of course since we are developing this new uh, this new ABFF these new conditions of the material we are also working on new tests in order to estimate crashworthiness and durability by considering uh, this, you can see here, bending tests, compression, torsion, fatigue. So fracture toughness, a lot of different tests uh, to consider which is the effect of this uh, ABFF. And just to see uh, an example here, you can see in the, in the top, the tube without uh, the reinforcement and then the different uh, ABFFs. And uh, as you can see here, the the point is that with this with this AVFF we can uh, trigger the the folding in different points and we can play on how the the the, the this front rail will fold and of course this have an impact in the yeah, absorbed energy so right now we we are just we did just uh, a first approach and a first uh, attempt on proposing just some uh, simple paths, but then it's expected that uh, with the more complex uh, uh, patterns, we can obtain even more uh, uh, absorbed energy. And of course, this will have an effect on reducing the, the passenger injuries and fertility since more material, the material will be able to uh, absorb more much energy. So thank you all for your attention. And if you have any question, uh, we we are really happy to, to answer it. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Sergi and Andoni. Uh, so it was a really interesting presentation, and I think that uh, we recognize a few elements in terms of a complexity of such projects where you have br bringing together several capabilities, and here you are developing materials, you develop design, develop concepts, tools, and mm -hmm. it's also a, a very nice project showcase the interaction with sisters projects like the Salema. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to pass on to some of the questions. I think we still have time for, let me check. Well, the, there's none from the audience, but I think that uh, I, I have uh, some questions of my own. I think that the first one is, as we've seen with uh, uh, the, uh, um, the fatigue for light, there's quite a, uh, I would say strong reliance on simulation tools in this project as well. So I'd like to know from your side, what are these 
I just say current uh, limitations of those tools or simulation tools and how this can be, what's perspective of improve them and whether there's an opportunity of this within this project also to uh, extend their capabilities. Okay, uh, if I might uh, uh, answer to this uh, question, I think that uh, it's true that we, we are going to base part of our work in simulation. Uh, in fact, part of the of the of the work is to improve, no, the, the the material characterization and so on. We haven't maybe talked too much about the 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 testing phase afterwards, but uh, in the second half of the project, there is a work package uh, dedicated to uh, to building, no, uh, prototypes, uh, manufacturing prototypes, and testing these in in real grass. Uh, not only in simulations, but also in, in physical testing, no? to, to have a, a correlation between simulation and physical testing and see if our conclusions are, uh, are, are valid. Okay, so thanks for clarifying that. Uh, <laughs> then uh, building upon that, I think that uh, since you're mentioning that, so you have a, a work package for um, also producing the prototypes and I think that's going to be quite a huge thing in the project. So could you tell us what what have you anticipated the main challenges related to the exploitation of the findings of the project and uh, you know scaling up your the, the solutions? Yeah maybe you can answer. Uh, yeah uh, the main as you get, you saw the technology is we are proposing, as you mentioned, a lot of new technologies and, and uh, new manufacturing processes that sometimes is not that easy to implement in the in current uh, manufacturing uh, producing uh, procedures. But uh, well, the aim of the the project is to at least present all of these new solutions and then find the the best way on to implement these strategies that perhaps they they are not. Uh, or maybe it's not feasible to implement it for all the situations on all the vehicles, but for some point where we really want to add value and that are critic, uh, or we have these critical parts uh, is where we can uh, implement these new solutions that sometimes are difficult to implement in the, all the other situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so that's uh, for me. Thank you very much. If there's no further questions for the audience, I'd like to thank again our speakers and yeah, pass on the thank word for to Christian now for the conclusions. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, all the speakers. Um, Carla, I don't know if you want to to say some some concluding words about your session, uh, the overall uh, impression you have, but uh, you may fit that in uh, do that in two minutes if you if. If you want, so please. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I'll be happy to. So I think that uh, looking to the, I think that the, the projects, uh, uh, there's a general theme is that we are trying to really push the envelope in terms of design, the solutions. I think that one of the important things that the takeaways is the need for developing uh, fast tests or a, a fast way of evaluating the materials because that's also. The 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 you no know, the DOEs are the things we want to do and this is overall is whether this should be fatigue or crash or any type of other tests that we we do to validate the the performance of the components. So I think there's a, there's a real need and these projects uh, two of those projects are addressing this um, this issue. Uh, we are also looking into so the the, the last project also mentioned the uh, you know different materials in terms of incorporation uh, hybrid solutions. So this is also something that is being done in in uh, Flamingo project. Is the fact that we are looking for different for alternatives of materials so based on, the, on standard materials like aluminium alloys and trying to uh, find different metallurgical concepts to um to improve strength in these materials and really make aluminium uh, a very attractive um uh, option in terms of uh, the application and in the in these um in in the automotive stru uh, automotive structures so this is some something also that we can take away from the uh, from the presentations and uh yeah so also 
there's of course all these um, the implementation, especially uh, we saw what Ovis said in terms of the development of the materials within the Flamingo is that there is a, uh, a need for developing, for the developing technology. In this case, we, have, we, we are looking to the, as a main barrier in this case, is integration nanoparticles, which depend pretty much on the uh, certification and casting process. So this, for the upscaling, this needs also some development step. So that's uh, that were my takeaways. Okay, thank you, Carla. Yeah, it was highlighted that there are, uh, opportunities in the automotive sector especially but uh, we need to stay innovative and i guess this project shows uh, some some uh, good ideas and uh, some uh, routes uh, to become more innovative uh, for the aluminium um so thank you very much so uh, for the first session we had philippe as a as a chair so if philippe is still there uh, he could also provide uh, his views about the, the first session so please philippe if you have some concrete remarks, yeah, I will, uh, given the time, I, I will try to do that uh, in a very compact way. Um, again, I think Martin, Patrick and Manel uh, gave a very good overview and, and, and good directions. Uh, uh, what I take out of that, um, in, in particular from the presentation of Martin, is that uh, the magnesium industry is very dynamic and uh, there is finally a very similar approach to aluminum. Uh, focusing on uh, recycling, looking at new technologies to decarbonize. And what I got from this pres presentation is that uh, the uh, the possibilities exist uh, to develop new technologies and, and go also to lower uh, magnesium uh, prime uh, CO2 content. So very, very uh, interesting perspective. Um, Patrick gave a, a, a very nice overview of the opportunities we can capture in terms of uh, uh, application of aluminum for the uh, automotive uh, industry. Uh, a nice perspective, I think he also clear, clearly highlighted in his comments that uh, it remains a very dynamic uh, market with a strong competition between uh, different materials. And so definitely we have to be extremely uh, active on that. I think there was a question uh, also we could not uh, address uh, from Bruno Schaefer's in the uh, in the Q and A box uh, about recycling loop. Uh, that that is definitely in in the background also of this presentation. How will we have the aluminium available? How will we avoid uh, to mix the aluminium? The question of uh, Bruno was about. Uh, having uh, possibly wrought uh, aluminum going into cast uh, aluminum and so break the circularity. I think that's a very uh, interesting remark, very interesting question. Uh, we have uh, challenges uh, to uh, impose aluminum, but we have also challenges uh, to come in managing uh, uh, the availability of low carbon prime and, uh, and, and managing the recycling loop. So, Great opportunities and also a good identification for automotive of which are the parts of interest that was extremely precise. Uh, I think helpful for a lot of people around the, the team meeting. And uh, Manel uh, 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 gave a, a, a nice presentation about uh, about Salema. I think it's a it's a good model to copy paste. You know, uh, just having this holistic approach, uh, uh, thinking material process part. Uh, and and um, what I liked also uh, is this uh, clear evidence that there is room for us to uh, simplify the alloy, to increase uh, their ac acceptance in residuals, uh, lowering the uh, alloying uh, elements, uh, thinking about uh, critical raw material. There are rooms for that and also opportunities for us to, to go to standards and better understand also, so that was also a nice message, uh, that things have to be to get, be done together, uh, linking, for example, composition, um, uh, characterization of fluidity and performance in high pressure die cast. That's also a very powerful approach. Uh, uh, we cannot think only about composition. It's uh, it's composition process and part together. So that was really a, a nice message. So good good overview, good directions, and good messages. I think uh, in this uh, in this session. Philippe, yes, I think we, we we managed to connect the dots to some extent, and it was quite complementary. The various 
contribution. So then I uh, would like to thank uh, all two chairs, so Philip and Carla, but also all the speakers. So thank you very much for your participation and uh, enjoy the weekend.